Super Soldier in Another World, 01-07, by Nivillac. The Sparrow and the Dragon. Final kind cruiser inbound, the ensign shouted, several blaring red monitors underlighting her face as she scrambled toward the intercom, Dragon class cruiser inbound, prepare for combat. Captain Henry Stoll maintained his air of calm command despite this harrowing news. He needed his crew members to see that he wasn't buckling under this pressure or they would soon follow suit. Internally though, Henry saw little hope of survival. A Dragon-class cruiser was the largest and most deadly of all the Final Kind spacecraft. Henry had been through some close calls with the Final Kind's fleet, but he and his crew had never faced a Dragon-class all by himself. His ship, the Sparrow, had beaten the odds for the past six months avoiding final kind ships and destroying the ones that got too close. They shouldn't have even made it this long, he knew that. He rubbed a hand through his short black hair, white-winged at the temples. His crow's feet felt like they were deepening with every passing moment, another sign of his growing stress and age. With the dragon appearing now, he was precisely aware of every wrinkle on his face furrowing as he thought on what he would have to do to save his ship. This little Sparrow-class frigate would be turned into a floating hunk of charred grey metal unless they got out of here, fast, but those Talon beams would easily stop their escape. That left only one option. He turned to address the amphitheater, where several crewmen fiddled with terminals and spoke in nervous whispers. The amphitheater was large enough for his voice to echo, and the little speaker implanted in his throat ensured that his orders wouldn't go unheard. You hear that? Henry asked his crew his voice deep and clear, they had to send a dragon after a sparrow, what does that tell you? He paused for a moment, the eyes of his crew glued to him as he stepped over to the glowing holo deck. it means they are scared of us, and they should be. We've been on the run for six months since they took earth, and every ship they sent after us never returned. Henry clasped his hands behind his back then, taking a deep breath to steady himself, we aren't going to escape, you all need to know that right now. The dragon can pull us right out of light speed with its talon beam. Knowing that, I want to take the beast down with us. Are you all with me? Nervous silence came over the amphitheater, interrupted only by the sounds of the terminals. The silence made Henry wonder if his men were all about to break out into panic. Thankfully, the crew all shouted their agreement, all rather wanting to go down fighting than submit to the rule of the final kind. Henry smiled at the enthusiasm of his crew, a single tear threatening to slide down his cheek. He wiped it away, turning to the holo deck next to him and pressing his thumb down on the glowing button. It was designed to pick up on any spacecraft nearby and display them for his crew to see. That way, they could all come up with a plan of action on how to engage the enemy, for they could all see what they were dealing with. A crimson glow illuminated the amphitheater, drowning out the bright overhead lights and showing a horrifying monstrosity to his men. Henry knew now why the brass referred to this as dragon. It wasn't merely in reference to its massive size, there was something draconic about the craft. The head of the ship almost looked like a horned skull, the snout stretching far from the thick scaly body. They weren't really scales of course, but the hull's design gave it that impression, looking nigh invulnerable. The gaping maw of the dragon housed the ship's most dangerous weapon, a planet-scorching plasma cannon. Thankfully, the final kind wouldn't use such a weapon on this little frigate. They only ever used it on worlds that refused to comply with their laws. What Henry was worried about were the thousands of other weapons dotting the craft, all capable of ripping through the Sparrow's shields with ease. The Sparrow did have one advantage here however, and that was the sheer size difference. Henry knew that the Dragon-class ships were meant for engaging multiple large opponents, not little birdies like this one. If they could just get close enough, they could detonate that weapon point blank, and dragon or not, the ship would be destroyed. The sparrow would have to do a short jump and hope the talons didn't grab them. Henry doubted that they would expect such a maneuver, and that was what he was banking on. He was about to start shouting orders when suddenly, several small red blips emerged from the dragon's afts. Boarding craft, one of the crew shouted, hundreds of them. Henry went wide-eyed and said aloud, so they don't want to outright destroy the ship. Did that mean they knew about that weapon? Were they going to try and take it so they could reverse engineer it? He couldn't allow that to happen. Get ready for a short jump. I want to be right next to the dragon. Henry ordered, 
clasping his hands behind his back and straightening his posture. I sir, but the boarding craft will reach us before we jump. The ensign yelled, still standing next to the intercom. Then wake him up, Henry ordered. I sir, the ensign replied, thumbing the intercom, ground troops, boarding craft imminent. Arm yourselves and get ready for close combat. Creo Station, unfreeze Hoplite 37. You heard her, get him going. Hoplite heard a man say outside his cryopod. I pressed the button as soon as I heard her sir, he should be unfreezing now, probably conscious. Another voice, a woman replied. The woman was correct, he indeed was conscious. He could feel the nano freeze melting right now, seeping out from his pores like sweat. The experience was mildly painful, as it was every time he was awoken, but he had learned long ago to ignore the pain. Turner would not tolerate weakness from him. It would be best to remain still until his casket was opened, moving around before the nano freeze was completely leaked out could cause significant damage to his flesh. Tubes are draining, nano freeze capsules are almost full. That same voice said. That was good, soon Hoplite would be out and in the fight again. He was only ever awoken when it was time to fight. As is a Hoplite's purpose. It wasn't long before he heard the familiar hiss of his Creo casket opening. His eyes were still frozen shut, but the lids would thaw soon and he would be able to see. Hoplite then felt the casket rising from the ground, and he knew that once it finished its motion that his feet would be pointing toward the ground, ready for him to step out. And he did. Hoplite felt the smooth cold metal beneath his feet, a wonderful feeling. He didn't like being in the cryopod of course, but he did what he was ordered to do, without question. He felt an exceptionally warm towel get draped over his head, of which he was grateful for. He pressed the warmth to his eyes, breathing in the heat and letting it soak into his emptied pores. He opened his eyes then, seeing the white fabric of the towel and the white overhead light seeping through it. Hoplite then removed the towel from his head, wrapping it around his pillar-like waist and staring down at the two Creo officers standing in front of him. They stared, awed by his presence as all humans were when they saw him. He was a human too, of course, but Hoplite knew why they were awed. Hoplite stood head and shoulders above the tallest of unmodified humans, and had the enhanced musculature to match their great height. Ah, welcome back sir. The first officer, a large man with short graying dark hair said. A man of this size likely wasn't used to being dwarfed in this way, hence his reaction, Hoplite figured. The woman next to him was far shorter, barely coming up to Hoplite's waist. He figured she was smaller than the average woman at least. They both wore the same light blue one-piece jumpsuit, indicating their role as Creo officers. Despite the size of the Creo station, it only needed around four people to operate it, two per shift. Hoplite furrowed his brow as he noticed that all of the other Creo caskets were empty. Rows upon rows of rectangular glass containers with metal backing sat completely vacant. Sparrow clearly wasn't running with a skeleton crew then. With the exception of Hoplite's casket, the rest were all uniform, capable of fitting humans of any normal size. Hoplite caskets, of course, had to be made larger. Hoplite, we got final kind boarding craft incoming. The man said, we might not even got time to get YA suited up. An unfortunate thing, but he could still crush skulls with ease, even without his armor. Despite that, he would prefer to have it on. Hoplite didn't know how many craft were coming, but he would be twice as effective with it on. Without a word, he made his way toward the armory, knowing by heart where it was located. He walked quickly, letting the towel fall from his waist without a care. He was not bothered by nudity, but he had noticed that normal humans were made uncomfortable by it. Hoplite had not felt the need to hold up the towel however, he would need both hands free to don his armor and he would need to discard it anyway. He heard the two Creo officers struggle to keep pace with him. Just why were they following after him? They quickly passed through several mechanized sliding doors and gray metal hallways filled with humans buzzing about, all only stopping to stare at Hoplite as he passed. At some point, the Creo officers had decided to stop following after him, knowing that their jobs were done. All they had to do was wake him up and tell him the situation, it had been unnecessary to follow him past that point. Soon, he entered the armory, stark naked before a scene of chaos. Marines, divers, and exotroops all quickly began donning their equipment, pulling rifles out of lockers and stepping into auto-assemblers to get heavy armor donned. 
rows upon rows of lockers and auto assemblers stretched out before him, the hinges opening and closing over the hissing mechanical limbs working to armor up the troops nearby. Soon, a marine caught sight of him, staring dumbstruck. Others soon noticed him passing through, heading toward the very end of this wide chamber. They continued to stare, dumbstruck as he scanned his retinas at the keypad at the end of the room. The heavy metal doors next to the pad hissed open immediately afterward, immediately sliding shut as soon as he was passed. Welcome Hoplite 37, a robotic voice said from the intercom. Hoplite ignored the automated greeting, approaching the auto-assembler at the center of the small chamber. A single light illuminated the round assembler, reflecting off the sleek white metal. The machine looked like nothing more than a big metal ring, and essentially that was what it was. It would mostly be the dozens of articulated mechanical limbs surrounding the ring that would be attaching his armor. He slipped his feet into the boots already attached to the assembly ring, and slid his hands into the matching gloves. They immediately locked his hands and feet in place as soon as they slid in, then the assembler went to work. The ring spun around as mechanical arms attached every individual piece of armor to his body, finally sliding the helmet on at the end of the process. He stepped out of the auto-assembler, sparing a quick glance at the mirror to make sure there weren't any errors with its assembly. The black adium armor he wore was trimmed with blood red lines, indicating his rank within the hoplites. A somewhat high rank, perhaps the equivalent of a lieutenant, though most hoplites were gone now, his paint was rendered near meaningless now. The knee plates were solid red, his wide shoulder plates encircled by a red trim. That would be the indicator for other hoplites in command, though to the eyes of a common soldier it was simple paint. He turned his head, making sure that the powerful mechanical limbs didn't dent any portion of the advanced combat helmet. Unlike other hoplites, his helmet didn't have a visor. For all intents and purposes, his helmet was a rounded hunk of metal, the only opening being for donning and removal. He could only see by function of several self-repairing microcameras implanted in his suit. They were everywhere, on the front and back of the helmet, to behind his knees and in front of his shoulders. Normally, he only had two sections of cameras active at a time, one front and back. Whenever he tried to have all the cameras active it just gave him a headache. He could control what cameras were active with a bump of his chin, allowing him to cycle through the functions. Hoplite had set this as a default long ago, leaving one eye to see his front and the other to see his back. It had taken some getting used to, but once he had mastered it, nothing could sneak up on him. 360 degrees of vision proved immeasurably useful when it was him alone against an army. The rest of the suit seemed to be in good order, no dents along the sleek frame of the suit. Well, to him it was sleek anyhow, compared to the older models. Regular humans had taken to calling it the fridge suit, a name which had stuck among the crew of the Sparrow. Perhaps it was just an alternative name to the Phalanx Armor Command never told him about. He could certainly see why the comparison was made between his suit and a fridge. His arms and legs, particularly the large torso plate, were broad and blocky, with the corners only slightly rounded off. This hoplite armor was built to take as much damage as possible, so it had been given the sturdiest construction possible. This durability was greatly amplified with a kinetic shield that would deflect projectiles and absorb explosions. Even without the shield, the thick adium plates would deflect all but the most powerful of blows, fridge suit indeed. Hoplite then re-emerged, donned in his mighty fridge suit and standing half a foot taller for it. The armory had emptied out considerably by then, with only a few soldiers left struggling to don their gear. Hoplite quickly walked over to an untouched weapons locker, taking a small ballistic pistol with extra mags and magnetizing it to his thigh. He then grabbed a ballistic rifle, sleek, black and semi-automatic with a simple holo dot sight. He attached that one to his back plate, and grabbed the final item from the locker, keeping it clutched in his grip. A long-barreled black shotgun, one powerful enough to blast a hole through through the doors of this ship. It was a heavy tool and could double as a sturdy bludgeon, a perfect tool for close combat. There were no sights attached, it was unnecessary, whatever you aimed at would turn to mist even with a glancing hit. It was right after he shut the locker that the sparrow shook, likely it was the boarding craft hit. They're drilling in, wherever you are, get ready, the ensign shouted, keep them busy for as long as you can until we can jump. Jump, so they were running again. 
Earth may have been lost, but surely there were other colonies out there still that they could go defend. Has humanity really lost? He began jogging toward the hallway, a group of marines trying to follow behind him. Through his back cameras he could see them huffing and puffing as his light jog left them in the dust. It wasn't that he didn't like having help, it was just that normal humans couldn't keep pace with him. It was after he passed into another hallway that he encountered them. Little armored creatures with elephant-like gray skin and huge bug-like eyes that stared at him with terror. They didn't even come up to his knees, but he knew that those little green glowing plasma rifles they held could melt through a man at minimum charge. There were around 20 of them, groups moving apart from one another to comb the halls for victims. Hoplite had become familiar with every combat race that was a part of the Final Kind's military, and he had killed more of these things than any other. They were called pugs by the troops, due to their pug-like faces, but the name of their race was Lomi. The go-to cannon fodder of the Final Kind, they bred like rabbits and were too dumb to question their law, but smart enough to fire a gun. Their armor was uniform, the same shade of red splashed haphazardly against hard plastic armor. Pugs were always meant to die absorbing shots meant for the more elite members of the Final Kind's military, so they gave them completely ineffective armor. It may have almost been better to let pugs just go naked, for the hard plastic armor they wore was bulky and hard for them to move in. He theorized that pugs were only equipped with the ineffective armor so that they would feel safer than they were. After all, it's better to have your cannon fodder feel like they'll be safe when doing a suicide charge. The pugs trained their guns on him, the coiled rifles charging up to max power. The plasma rifles, like all final kind weapons, were sleek as they were deadly, the barrel looking like a steel honeycomb. Hoplite could see down the barrels to the tiny plasma reactor within. He had once put a bullet right down the center of the barrel, and hit that reactor with devastating results. The resulting explosion usually matched that of a standard issue frag grenade, but Hoplite wouldn't be doing any trick shots unless he had ample opportunity. Hoplite fired his shotgun then, the powerful rounds splattering gray blood and entrails all across the hall. The slugs that didn't directly hit ricochet down the hall, denting the metal and flying into pugs left and right. A few bounced off his energy shield, draining it only by a fraction before they recharged. After the damage was done, only three pugs remained, all screaming down the hallway away from him. They were immediately gunned down before they could turn the corner, automatic rifles turning them to grey chunks of fleshy goo and sending sharp chunks of plastic flying. He darted down to the center of the hallway, hopping over bodies and pointing his gun down the boarding craft's mouth. The black interior of the pod was only lit by a series of dark red light strips, and Hoplite could see that it had been emptied of all occupants. He immediately turned, running down the hall and rounding the corner where the pugs had been shot apart. The marine squad at the opposite end of the hall nearly opened fire on him as he sprinted toward them, but they held their fire once they realized what he was. They moved to greet him, but he rushed past the squad, intent on finding more aliens to butcher before command put him back in Creo. And oh he did find them. More pugs than he could count got blasted away by his shotgun or had their skulls caved in with a firm kick. Eventually he found the other aliens he knew would be on the ship, the larger, more deadly variants. He engaged in a gunfight with a tentacled swagley, the eldritch creature blasting him with rays of superheated plasma from the many tendril mounted guns it held. It had a broad torso hidden beneath the many moving tendrils, its four insect-like legs skittering around to avoid gunfire. The armor it wore could stop small caliber rounds easily, but larger guns could punch through the scaled alloy. He ended it quickly enough with a well-placed shot from his rifle, punching through its octopi-like skull and sending the pugs around it running in terror. He shot them all dead and continued down to the vehicle bay, where hundreds of marines and aliens battled. He sniped more swagley and pugs before turning his attention to the flyers. The large vehicle bay proved to be an ample combat theater for what the marines merely called wasps. They were man-sized insectoid creatures with strong exoskeletons and two pairs of arms and legs. Their racial name was Jaro, but Hoplite preferred to call them wasps as well. The buzzing of their massive translucent wings terrified the troops, but to Hoplite it was merely a nuisance. At some point, he found himself next to a mounted turret, freshly set up. Hoplite took to the turret and gunned down the wasps, punching through their exoskeletons and sending them crashing to the ground dead, bright green blood mixing in with the variety of colors now staining the floor. 
After the turret ran out, he ripped it free of its mount and threw it at a group of pugs that had pinned a marine down with gunfire. The man had been trying to make himself as small as possible behind a little metal crate, one that was half his size. The detached turret crushed one of the pugs, and seeing that their comrade had been turned to mush, they scattered. The marine saw Hoplite standing far above him on the platform overlooking the vehicle bay, flashing him a thumbs up. Hoplite leapt from the platform, landing on top of a tank and drawing his shotgun. There were still more aliens to kill. Jump is a go, the ensign shouted. That didn't matter, the aliens were on the ship and they would still be here after the jump. He and the marines continued fighting, hoping to reclaim the vehicle bay from the invaders. Hoplite never noticed when the ship finished the light jump, nor even when it started, but it seemed that right as they were mopping up the last aliens, the captain came on the intercom. It's been an honor serving with you all. We're taking out this dragon class here and now with the antimatter bomb we've been carrying. Hopefully that'll put a big enough dent in the final kind that they leave our colonies alone. Good work everyone, see you on the other side. Hoplite froze in place then. Dragon class, antimatter bomb. Was he going to, he was going to die. An unfamiliar feeling welled up within him, something he hadn't felt since his first days as a hoplite recruit all the way back when he was just a child. Fear. That fear left him paralyzed for long enough that he didn't react to the armored jeep being chucked at his head by an ape like Ugoro. The corded strength of its four arms sending the vehicle speeding towards his head like a freight train. If Hoplite had braced for the attack, it certainly would have hurt, but he would still be in the fight. He was not braced. It collided with his helmet and snapped his head back, sending him crashing into unconsciousness. It was dark, that was the first thing that came to mind. Were his cameras disabled? He bumped with his chin, seeing the display come up. Just darkness, the cameras themselves were functional. He felt up and down his body, and came to realize that he was floating. Zero GS, but he wasn't out in space, there would be stars if he was. This pure blackness meant two things, he was still in the vehicle bay, and the power had gone out. That would mean that life support and the gravity had gone out. It was likely that all the crew were dead by now, including the final kind invaders. His suit could keep him alive for up to 12 hours without oxygen, so how much time had passed? He bumped his chin again, seeing the time display on his HUD. He had gotten out of Creo, roughly 11 and a half hours ago. He had around 30 minutes to get to an oxygen-rich environment or he'd suffocate. He activated the built-in flashlight on the side of his helmet, revealing that yes, he was still on board the sparrow in the vehicle bay. Bodies of both man and alien bumped into each other on occasion, sometimes passing through floating liquid clouds of differently colored blood. He activated the thrusters in his boots and backplate, and floated up to the exit, moving around floating corpses and vehicles. Hoplite drifted through the empty and dark halls of the sparrow, passing over the bodies left behind. He didn't stop to try and identify any of them, there was no point and he needed to get to an escape pod. Those would have their own power and life support system. He could use that to renew his oxygen supply and get off this ship if need be. Hoplite knew where the pods were, but he grew anxious as he found several of them missing. Likely either final kind or fellow humans got to them and escaped after the bomb, speaking of which, did it work? Captain Stoll had come on the intercom to say that he was going to suicide bomb a Dragon class cruiser with an antimatter bomb. Hoplite didn't know too much about them, but he did know that they were extremely experimental, and that the Sparrow had been outfitted with one to test it out. A test that had never come to be after the final kind took Earth. Likely they were finished subjugating humanity to follow their draconian laws. It seemed as if its effect was more like that of an EMP than an antimatter bomb. After all, the ship was still here and the power was out, what else could that mean? His thoughts were cut off after he finally found a pod. The very last one at the end of the hall, pill-shaped and empty of any passengers. He floated inside and activated the life support system, shutting the sliding doors behind him. He waited there for an hour, just floating as his oxygen tank refilled itself. The phalanx suit could detect when he was in a zero-oxygen environment and sealed itself off accordingly, but when his environment had air, it opened its filters and sucked it into a hyper-compressed oxygen tank. After that tank was refilled, he shut off the life support and reopened the doors, his filters immediately sealing. 
he floated through the corridors until he finally came upon the bridge. The amphitheater was completely empty of bodies. They might have made it to the escape shuttles along with Captain Stoll, but where would they escape to? There had to be somewhere they intended to land the pods. Either that, or they had found another human ship and chose to escape to it, though that was unlikely. Ship was blacked out, no hope of using the holodeck for anything. He could always just use the engineer ladders to take a peek outside. There should be one around the shuttle bay he just left, engineers constantly had to use those ladders to keep from floating off the ship. It wasn't like they would float off if they let go, they always carried cables with them to stay safe when outside the ship. Hoplite wouldn't bother with safety cables, his boosters would let him get back to the ship even if he somehow lost his grip. He didn't have to search long for the access hatch that would lead him outside. It was encircled by a bright yellow line and red engineer access. He keyed the button next to the hatch, but got no response. Right, power was out across the sparrow, he'd need to be more physical here. He slipped his fingers in the groove between the sliding doors, and magnetized his boots to the ground. Hoplite strained, gritting his teeth as he forced the thick doors apart with his and the suit's enhanced strength. He only got it as far open as his arm span before he stepped through, the door slamming shut behind him. They made no noise as they did so. The airlock was small, with only a single closed manhole in the center of the room. Considering the fact that the power was out, he would have to pry this one open as well. That proved to be no large feat. The previous door had been a challenge, but this was as easy as peeling an orange to him. Soon he was scrambling down the ladder, kicking open the second hatch at the bottom and climbing the ladder out into space. He quickly climbed the ladder, only briefly observing the surrounding stars before ascending. He could see half of a green moon far off to his left, that must have meant that there was a planet nearby right. Soon, he had his answer after he reached the top of the sparrow. He peered over the top of the ladder to see a gigantic eyeball stared back at him. The iris matched the many bloodshot veins stretching toward the center, all a deep shade of oceanic blue. Hoplite saw that parts of this entity's eyeball were a deep infected green, with patches of red and yellow on the upper half of the thing. The lower half seemed to be rotting the worst it seemed, with a blighted deep purple shade on the left and dead reddish brown on the right. The eyelids were both different shades as well, the top being a fiery red and the bottom an icy white, the lashes matching both. The sclera was the same shade of blue as the veins and iris, with the pupil being yet an even deeper shade of cobalt. Hoplite stared at the monstrosity, which stared back at him, not blinking. His hands dented the grey metal ladder as they tightened their grip. He waited for it to blink, waited for it to do something but nothing ever came. After his fearful all subsided, Hoplite realized that this eyeball was a planet. How could that be? How could the geology of this world have come to be shaped in such a way? What were the odds of this being pure chance? Was this some kind of final kind art world? He had never known them to be artistic in anything but genocide. Hoplite shook his head, there was no way that this was a final kind world, if it was he would have seen countless cruisers and defense platforms in the atmosphere, but aside from that, there was nothing. Nothing except the dark husk of the Dragon Class cruiser. It drifted lifelessly, no lights shining from its sleek scaled bulk. It dwarfed the sparrow a thousandfold, being nearly the size of the green moon nearby. So the bomb had worked, it had to have had the effect of an EMP then. But, if it had just been an EMP, then why was the dragon missing its front and back ends? From the way the ship was angled, he could see that the mouth of the dragon had been sheared clean off, same with the back. This revealed the honeycomb structure within the dragon, matching the interior of the other final kind spacecraft. There were questions he had, very many questions that he needed answers to. Hoplite had a feeling that those answers would be down there on that cosmic eyeball. Light illuminated the left half of the planet, though with the tilt, it would be getting dark soon on that side. If he were to launch as soon as possible, then he would likely land on that left half. Did the surviving crew jettison down there after all? Before all the air evacuated from the life support system? They must have. But if they evacuated to that world, that meant that the final kind likely evacuated what personnel they could as well. Somewhere down on that world, his fellow men fought against the forces of the final kind, without him. He would be joining them soon though, they just had to hold out a little longer. For the next three hours, he gathered up weapons, rations, and other equipment into the shuttle, 
as much as it would be able to carry. Hoplite had no idea what the situation would be like down there, but he wouldn't be caught unprepared. He packed all the scavenged gear he found into the eight seats on either side of the pod, making sure to pack as much extra ammo as he possibly could. Hoplite then climbed into the pilot seat then, and started the pod once more. The door slid shut behind him and he punched it, pushing the lever forward and feeling the shuttle push out of the dead sparrow. Hoplite had to angle the shuttle down toward the planet just right, he didn't want to crash in the middle of the ocean after all. He aimed for the greenest part of the planet, and activated the thrusters. It would be a while before the pod actually reached the planet's atmosphere, considering that he was launching from right next to the moon. These shuttles were fast, but they couldn't go light speed. He guessed it would be an hour or two before it actually reached the eye. Light barely touched that portion in the western hemisphere, so by time he landed, Hoplite estimated that it would indeed be nighttime as he had predicted earlier. That wouldn't matter much to him, the only thing that made him uncomfortable was the time it would take to make it planetside. Hoplite knew that worrying about the time of his landing wouldn't get him there any faster. So he waited, seeing the massive world eye drawing closer, and closer until... S. She heard her sister, Lya say. Hem. Essa replied, opening her eyes to see the starry sky above her. What do you think the elders are going to do, about the monster next to the moon? Lya asked her. Essa sighed, sitting up from the grass to look at her younger sister. She was in her fifth year now, and was loaded with questions that Essa didn't have the answers to. Probably ignore it. Look at how high up the moon is Lyre, they can't reach it with their magic. She pushed her long black hair behind one of her pointed ears as she spoke, it hasn't even done anything, if it was going to, it would have eaten the moon by now. Best not to worry about it too much. Lyre scrunched her brow in thought turning her little head back up to the sky. Like Essa, she had their mother's hair, pure black like the sea at night. Essa almost couldn't see her sister's hair for how dark it was tonight. Essa enjoyed little moments like this, just out in the wilderness with her sister on a summer night, crickets chirping, frogs croaking, and the occasional firefly flitting about. This clearing was Essa's favorite to lay down in. The grass was high enough that it felt like laying down on the softest mattress, and the trees were so perfectly spaced that the broad green leaves served to frame the night sky for viewing. It was like a perfect painting, with the green moon shining down on everything while its ever-present companions, the stars, twinkled like glass in the sun. The new addition of the moon monster definitely was something that drew a lot of her attention, but its imposing presence did not detract from the natural beauty of the night sky. The elders and everyone else in the bastion were horrified, and Essa didn't blame them for that. The thing was nearly the size of retina, the moon itself, but Essa still didn't think it was going to do anything. It had been up there all day and was just sitting there, likely just enjoying the view as she was, or maybe it was a new moon. With that blocky shape she doubted it but it could also be one of the stars, come to pay retina a visit. Being an elf, she'd be able to enjoy this view for eternity, unless she died of unnatural means. An uncomfortable thought, best to turn her attention to something less anxiety-inducing. Like her adorable little sister, those big glassy grey eyes were those of their father, and Essa also shared that trait. If they had been around the same age, they likely could have passed as twins, but Issa was in her 29th year. She was an adult, but 29 was still considered by nearly everyone in the Bastion to be a mere child. It was really irritating, after all. But the moon monster sent some of the stars falling. Lya said, interrupting her thoughts. Essa shrugged, laying back down on the grass to stare at the sky, just a meteor shower. They happen sometimes. As she finished saying that, she caught sight of a new star in the sky, one that was growing, and fast. Essa sat up again, staring as the star shone brighter and brighter, grabbing Lya and holding her tight. Lya herself was just as mystified by the growing star and she did nothing else but point at it. Then, much to Issa's horror, the star screamed, the horrifying shriek growing louder and louder as it continued to grow. Then it suddenly streaked across the sky, screeching as it went, wrapped in a ball of molten fire. She grabbed Lyre tighter, turning her away from the horrid thing as she realized that it was falling right towards them. It was as if it became aware of their position, turning to land upon them and scorch their skin from their bones. That's when she began running, turning away from the screaming star while clutching her little sister as hard as she could. 
Lyre began weeping as they passed into the forest, weaving between trees as she went. Then, the star collided with the forest, shaking her to her core and sending her ears ringing. Chunks of moist dirt and burning hunks of wood flew, some barely missing Issa as she ran screaming in terror. She did not look back, she did not stop, she kept running until she was back in the bastion, safe with her sister and away from the screaming star. She knew that she would have to tell the elders about this, they had to know what to do about this, and if they didn't, the Hawk Hall surely would. Landing Hoplite had tried to ease the landing, but these shuttles weren't made for gentle groundings. They were exceptionally sturdy, so he didn't worry too much about it sustaining any damage. The only downside to this hard landing was that any nearby enemies would hear it from a mile away, possibly more. He supposed that his allies could have as well, but odds were that the final kind would find him first. It was safe to assume that the dragon had pumped out more pods than the sparrow. The grassy clearing he had aimed for was split in twain by the crashing pod, kicking up moist soil and sending thousands of grass blades soaring through the air. The shuttle slid into the forest shortly after landing, punching through half a dozen trees and sending them crashing to the forest floor, wooden shrapnel flying. Finally it slid to a stop, the nose tilting the last tree forward at an angle. Hoplite stood from his seat as soon as the pod stopped, approaching the sealed metal doors and pressing the keypad next to it. They slid open with a groan as Hoplite grabbed a nearby shotgun, emerging from the pod and scanning the surrounding forest for hostiles. When he spotted none, he eased up, bumping his chin to check for any nearby radio signals. If there were any signals within a 10-mile radius, his suit would pick up on and play them automatically, allowing him to switch between each signal it detected. Unfortunately, all that could be heard was static. Perhaps these tall trees interfered with the signals. That was if there were any signals to even pick up. Hoplite supposed that he could try and reach the top of one of these trees, but the sheer weight of his suit would break most branches he tried to climb. He could always take the suit off, but without the assembler, it would be incredibly difficult and time-consuming to put back on by himself. Hoplite knew that eventually, he would need to remove the suit in order to take care of his more human needs. The phalanx suit was built for engaging in and ending conflicts relatively quickly, not for long missions behind enemy lines like the other models that Hoplites utilized. It had no built-in system for waste disposal, a most unfortunate design flaw, given his current situation. Surely a combat engineer would have made it planet-side, they would be able to reattach his armor quicker than he by himself could. It was just a matter of rendezvousing with turn and personnel. He scrunched up his brow as he made his way back toward the drop pod, an unsettling thought occurring to him. They had all evacuated hours before Hoplite had made it to the surface, and depending on this world's rotation, they could all be on the opposite side of the planet. Hot frustration bubbled up within him, but he quickly bottled it. Hoplite couldn't afford to feel such an immature emotion during this time, he had to begin searching for his fellow soldiers. The forest around him was buzzing with life, fireflies floated through the air, illuminating small portions of these dark woods. Crickets and frogs both sounded off with croaks and chirps seemingly in tune with one another. The surrounding trees were deciduous and tall, each one easily reaching over 60 feet in height. From the light of the fireflies, he could see the deep green hue of their broad leaves. A light breeze blew through the forest, shifting the horribly familiar leaves. Frogs, fireflies, crickets, these trees and particular species of grass, they were all from Earth. Hoplite had been trained on the homeworld, so he had become familiar with the flora and fauna inhabiting it. What were these doing here on a backwater world with no orbital defense stations? This couldn't be a human colony, there wasn't even a token defense fleet around it. But how else could this be explained? Perhaps there had been the beginnings of a colony here but they only got as far as terraforming before they had to leave. Maybe the final kind found this fledgling colony and destroyed it. No, that couldn't be it. They would be colonizing this world instead if they had. A lot of habitable worlds shared a common template when it came to life forms, perhaps these weren't all exactly from Earth. There could be differences that he couldn't see on the surface. He would need to look into this another time. For now, he would just concentrate on exploring the surrounding forest. He returned to the pod, grabbing a pistol, combat knife, and an automatic rifle and clipping them to his thighs and back. After that, Hoplite re-emerged, 
sealing the pod doors shut behind him. Time to get started. He began heading south, in the direction the pod was facing. As he passed through the trees he kept his eyes peeled, one eye looking through each camera as he went. As he passed each tree, he marred its surface with his combat knife. He was intentionally moving in a straight line so he could easily head back to the pod if need be, but it always paid to play it safe. If somehow he ended up losing his way, he could simply follow the marked trees all the way back no problem. He went on like that for an hour, keeping a brisk pace and only spotting nocturnal forest critters. Nocturnal forest critters that were from Earth. Hoplite shook his head, that would be an issue for later. No hostiles for at least an hour south, time to run back and repeat this in each direction. There, displayed on his back camera. A humanoid shadow peered down on him from a branch high above him, almost out of his camera's view. Whatever it was, it had no idea that Hoplite could see it up there. He was unsettled to realize that, if the shadow hadn't moved, Hoplite likely wouldn't have been able to distinguish it from the blackness above. The leaves of the trees had blocked out most of the green moonlight from the forest below. He had only been able to see the thing after the branch it was moving across ever so slightly shifted beneath its weight. Hoplite turned, aiming his shotgun up at the exact position of the thing, finger on the trigger. Identify. Hoplite ordered. The thing didn't reply, instead stiffening to blend in with the surrounding shadow. Identify or I will open fire in 3, 2 dash. Wait. A voice shouted from above. Hoplite removed his finger from the trigger, but kept his gun trained on the stranger. Someone from the sparrow, or the hypothetical lost colony. He needed answers and he was going to get them. Down here now. Hoplite ordered, tone commanding. The man then dropped to the forest floor, landing cleanly on both legs without shattering them. Did this person have reinforced bones? A normal human couldn't drop from such a height without at least breaking something. Hoplite bumped his chin, activating his flashlight and illuminating the stranger, who gasped in terror. You said you wouldn't open your fire upon me, the man shouted, scrambling back while raising his hands over his eyes. I didn't, Hoplite said simply. He was a tall man, clad in black cloth that covered him head to toe, leaving only his bright green eyes visible. Hoplite felt relieved to see another human, but why had this person tried to sneak up on him? Did he think that Hoplite was final kind? It was really dark beneath these trees, perhaps he mistook his large size for that of an alien. Identify. Hoplite ordered. L. Lance Gilderbreeze. The man squeaked, lowering his hands but maintaining a tense posture. Lance Gilderbreeze. What a strange name. Rank. Hoplite asked, lowering his shotgun and standing at rest. Rank. Lance asked, his brows creasing slightly. I. I just watch. No ranks. Hoplite stared. So you're a civilian? Hoplite asked, approaching Lance slowly. He didn't want to scare him away if he was a civilian, they tended to run away from him if he got too close too quickly. Lance stood his ground thankfully, staring up at Hoplite's helmet with shaking legs. They were merely five feet apart now, the difference in height now apparent to Lance, who had to crane his head far back to look into Hoplite's helmet. I well yes, but not dash, Lance started. What happened to your colony? Hoplite asked, did the final kind destroy your ships? Why didn't they wipe you all out afterwards? Colony, final kind, Lance asked, Golem, I know not what you speak of, I was ordered to investigate the falling star and came upon you by chance. Golem, Hoplite asked, his own brows knitting together in thought. Are you not a Golem? Lance asked, what are you? A Hoplite. He replied, take me to who's in charge, he ordered, I don't think that I dash. Now, Hoplite ordered again, voice low and dangerous. Lance led Hoplite through the forest, the chorus of insects and animals helping to dim the deafening silence between the two men. The green moon overhead was full from down here planet side, its light shining down between the leaves above them. Despite the added light from the full moon however, the forest appeared mostly dark, the thick foliage above blocking most light from reaching the forest floor. The civilian had thankfully not attempted to make any small talk as they walked, seemingly content to remain as silent as Hoplite. Whoever Lance was, it was clear to Hoplite that he knew these woods like the back of his hand. Even with the darkness of the forest Lance seemed to recognize landmarks that seemed insignificant to Hoplite's greater perception. Lance would nod to a rock here, 
stare at a tree there and simply continue on as if prowling the halls of his own home. This watcher classification and Lancer's state of dress implied that he patrolled these woods at night for his superiors, whoever they may be. Surely these humans had to have access to bionics, for how else would Lance have been able to leap off that branch without breaking anything? At the minimum Lance would have reinforced joints, but then why was his movement so smooth? Civilian augmentations usually had downsides, reinforced joints caused stiff movement, synaptic stimulators caused random bouts of twitching, and adrenaline pumps came with a high risk of heart failure if overused, and that was just to name a few. Of course, those were just civilian augmentations, military-grade orgs performed better and lasted a lifetime, and even compared to those, Hoplite's own bionics were superior in every way. So why was it that Lancer's walk was smooth and not as jagged as a cheap labor droid? Was there a military installation on this world? Perhaps Hoplite should begin asking questions instead of letting this silence drag on, despite his preference for it. What kind of augmentations do you have installed? Hoplite asked, causing Lance to nearly jump free of his boots. He took a breath and turned back to Hoplite, his eyes conveying confusion as they both halted their march. What do you mean? Lance asked, his tone confused. It was possible that, if he was somehow unaugmented, that Lance had never heard of bionics. They weren't commonplace among civilians and only a few soldiers were chosen to receive military-grade ones. It was also possible that this world had been cut off from greater humanity since before bionics became more popular. Hoplite also supposed that this world could have a lighter gravity than normal, but it certainly felt Earth-like right now. When he was out of his suit Hoplite would be able to get a better grasp on this world's GS. You don't have reinforced joints, Hoplite asked, continuing to walk. Lance then turned, continuing his lead as they conversed. No, Lance said, still seemingly confused, I know not what you mean. For a man, Lance's voice was unnaturally high-pitched, Hoplite realized. Well, he was definitely on the smaller side so the higher pitch wasn't too strange. When you fell from that tree, Hoplite said, you didn't break anything. Well of course not, I am what I am, Lance said simply. The human body cannot sustain a fall like that without injury unless augmented, Hoplite said matter-of-factly. Lance slowed his walk and turned to look at Hoplite, brows creased, do you think that I may dash? Whatever Lance had been about to say was cut off when Hoplite quickly turned his back on him, aiming his shotgun at a tree. Out of his back camera Hoplite had spotted a shadow dart between a pair of trees, silent as a whisper. I know you're there, Hoplite said, mustering up all the menace in his voice as he could, come out now or I will open fire. Did you hear something? Lance asked, stepping closer to Hoplite and drawing a broad dagger from his belt. As if on cue, a small chittering creature stepped out from behind the tree. Hoplite shone his light upon it, revealing a disgusting monstrosity with crawling, warty pink flesh and dead milky white eyes. The dripping thing was the size of a large dog, its muzzle open to reveal two sets of jagged rotting teeth. It lacked any kind of hair, so the many bubbling blisters and pustules were on full display much to Hoplite's displeasure. This dog-like mutant disgusted him. The creature lunged for Hoplite then, salivating more open to bite down on his leg. Instead, Hoplite reared back, and kicked the mutant in the skull. Its head exploded into a pinkish miasma, sending the corpse flying back and splattering its rotting grey matter all across the forest floor. He saw Lance from his back camera step away from the carnage, retching as he fell to his knees and undid his black mask, to reveal a distinctly feminine face. Hoplite almost did a double take. He could have sworn that Lance had been a man. He took a second to re-examine Lance, seeing that yes, there were indeed curves there, hidden as they may be beneath the thick dark clothing. He briefly berated himself for not being able to tell the difference, but then realized that this information changed nothing about his current objective. Lance's face was pale, with high cheekbones and a small nose set over a pair of full lips and tapering chin. She vomited on the dirt, spitting and cursing in a way that reminded him of how the marines on board the Sparrow spoke to one another. She looked up to him, wiping her mouth clean with her wrist and struggling to her feet. Lance lifted up her mask once again, leaving only her bright green eyes visible. This is bad, she said, staring at the rotting corpse of the mutant, they've never gotten this far into the Feywood. What are they? 
Hoplite asked, scanning the surrounding forest via his cameras. You must be from farther up north, whatever you are, to not have heard of the fiends. What are fiends? Hoplite asked. The colony of this world clearly had a mutant problem. He couldn't tell if this creature was the result of radiation or genetic manipulation, but they shouldn't be a problem to him in his armor. Lance, however, was a different story. Had that thing gotten its rotten teeth into her that would have been the end of her. The risen dead, she said, breaking into a run and urging him to follow, at least these ones are. We have to hurry, there will be more of them around here soon and I have to warn my people. Hoplite easily kept pace with Lance, scanning the forest for any movement from these risen dead. At first, she seemed to be holding back from running at her full speed, but quickly upped her pace once she realized that he had been trailing right behind her. He wasn't sure why she had referred to these fiends as the risen dead, mutation didn't reanimate living things. Certainly it had appeared to be a dead thing walking, but corpses don't have the capability to move. That pink miasma was something he had never seen however. Was it some kind of cloud of nanomachines? Those were incredibly rare and unless one had authorization from turn and authorities, absolutely illegal, but if anything could puppet a corpse and make it mobile, it would be nanotech. Yet Hoplite sincerely doubted that these people had access to nanotech if they didn't even have bionics. After a couple of minutes of uninterrupted sprinting, Hoplite saw a group of three fast-moving creatures gaining on them from his rear camera. They snarled and kicked up small clouds of debris as they approached them on four legs. Soon, he was able to make out more details on the fiends as they further closed the distance. The same as the first fiend he had killed, four-legged rotting canine mutants. Small pieces of fetid flesh fell from their bodies as they ran, revealing sections of yellowed bone here and there. Hoplite could easily outrun these things if he had really wanted to, but he didn't want to leave Lance behind to fend for herself. It shouldn't be a problem dispatching them anyway. He slid to a halt and quickly pivoted, aiming his shotgun at the approaching fiends and pulling the trigger. The creatures had been very close together when Hoplite pulled the trigger, the blast rendering the three fiends into nothing but a pile of rotting goop. Lance dropped her dagger, clutching her ears as the sound of the blast echoed through the forest like thunder. The shot punched through the trees, sending shards of wood flying through the air before the rounds finally buried themselves either within the flesh of the trees or a few feet deep in the dirt. The strange pink miasma flowed from the holes created in the fiends, and for a brief instant Hoplite could swear that a demonic face had formed in the colorful mist to glare at him. It was gone almost as soon as it appeared, leaving him questioning if it had actually been there. She turned to him, still clutching her ears as she saw what his shati had wrought. Hoplite turned around, running to her as fast as he was able. Lance's eyes widened in terror as he bore down on her, fist raised to deliver a killing blow. She fell on her rear, hands raised in anticipation of the blow to come. He swung then, his massive fist crashing into the skull of a fourth fiend that had been mid-lunge. His punch went straight through the dog-like creature's skull, his fist having connected with the roof of the fiend's open mouth. It hung from his forearm, latched like a worm on a hook. Lance had screamed when he swung, shutting her eyes and looking away when his fist cratered the fiend's head. Probably a good thing, considering the brown fluid and bits of brain dripping down on top of her. When she looked up and saw what hung just over her head, she scrambled away, retching again as the pink miasma flowed over her. Whatever this pink mist was, it had to smell horrible to prompt that kind of reaction. Thankfully his suit could filter out the stench, but he had been trained to ignore such smells should his suit fail him. He checked his cameras for any more incoming hostiles, but saw none. The sound of his shotgun would have alerted any more fiends in the area to their location. If he was going to get Lance safely back to her home, then he couldn't afford to stay at her pace. He scooped her up from the ground with his free hand as she finished retching. She struggled for a moment before he started running, picking up more and more speed as he went. Just, ah, uh, just go straight ahead until you see the bastion, she shouted, as if she couldn't even hear her own voice. Well, she had just heard the equivalent of a grenade exploding right next to her ear he supposed. Hoplite didn't know what this bastion looked like, but he had a feeling he would know it when he saw it. He ran faster, kicking up chunks of moist dirt behind him as he went. Lance squealed as he reached 50 miles per hour, the servos in his armor and legs working in tandem to speed his flight. 
He had to carefully weave between trees and hop over rocks to avoid splattering Lance by accident. Normally he wasn't quite this careful in the fridge suit when he reached top speed, but if he made any kind of collision right now while holding Lance she would die instantly. Thankfully he didn't have to maintain this level of caution for that long as he came upon what had to be the bastion. He slowed his approach as he and Lance came upon a massive wall of gnarled roots. Several thousand arm thick ones overlapped one another with the pattern only broken by a man-made dark iron palisade gate in its center. The root wall had to be well over 50 meters in height at its lowest point and it stretched in either direction farther than he could see. This alone would have been a baffling sight, but there was more to this strange construct. These roots writhed and stretched over one another, barely covering a deep emerald glow from within the root wall. This hue illuminated the whole of the wall from bottom to top, glowing like a dim beacon in the dark. What sort of tech did these lost colonists have if they could manipulate plant life in this way? Hoplite had been to dozens of worlds over the last 200 years, and he had never seen anything like this. He knew that there were some incredibly talented people in the Milky Way that were capable of growing plant life the way they wanted it to be, but he wasn't sure if any of them could even mimic a portion of this achievement. He put down Lance, her legs shaking as she braced against him, wiping sweat from her bro. I've, she huffed, never seen a construct move as fast as you. What mage bound you? She asked, looking up at him. Mage, construct, I'm a hoplite, not a machine. He told her, we need to get moving and warn the other colonists. She took a deep breath, standing up straight and looking at him with a scrunched brow, what? She half yelled, brow scrunched and eyes narrowed. Her ears couldn't still be ringing that bad would they? Hoplite shook his head, pointing to the gate and making a beeline for it, Lance trailing just behind him. They need to see me first. They won't let you in unless I say you mean no harm, Lance said, pulling up in front of him as they neared the palisade. Why would they not let him in without Lance's say so? He was military personnel and this was an emergency. If they denied him access then he would have to use force to get in. Hoplite needed to warn the colonists of the fiends and then use any comms equipment they might have to reach the survivors of the Sparrow. Two men, and they were men this time, stood on the opposite side of the gate clad in some kind of ornate combat armor. It was a suit of sleek cobalt metal, the plates interlocking and with ornate carvings of leaves and feathers on their surface. The green glow of the root wall overhead lit the guards' faces, and Hoplite could only describe them as. What had that one older marine called the younger one with the long wavy hair? Ah uh, yes, pretty boy. They didn't look like soldiers at all. These two had that same kind of long flowing hair the kind that covered their ears on the way down to their shoulders. This was technically allowed in Turner military branches but opened the common soldiery up for mockery. Their faces were completely smooth, with nary a wrinkle or scar on them. Where were their combat helmets? He looked, seeing that both men cradled open-faced metal helmets in one arm while clutching what appeared to be. Why were gate guards only using spears? As Lance approached the gate, Hoplite's mind ran at a top speed. If these colonists only had spears that could only mean that they had lost any means to manufacture ammo and had to resort to more primitive means for survival. After all, when he first encountered Lance in the forest she didn't even have a pistol, just a dagger. That hadn't been a combat knife either, it looked handmade just like the ornate plumed spears the two guards held point up to the ceiling. The ground here before the gate was just well trampled dirt, nothing grew in this little tunnel besides a stray weed here and there. From what he could see from behind this palisade, the forest simply continued on, unbroken by any sort of road or buildings. Wait a second, he noticed as one of the trees, moved. It simply uprooted itself, and on writhing green glowing roots, scampered along the forest floor like some kind of deep sea octopus. Hoplite saw what appeared to be a balcony, built high up into the side of this creature. A warm orange glow could be seen from the hallway leading from the balcony, like one of those seasonal glow globes that had been on the sparrow. He saw a man leaning over the balcony, looking bored as the tree scampered deeper within the forest to parts unknown. Never, never in all his time alive had he seen any creature like that. It was simple, that thing could not actually be a tree. He didn't know how evolution would cause a creature to take such a form, but that was the only thing he could think of, that or genetic manipulation, which these people most likely wouldn't know how to do. These colonists had seemingly tamed these creatures, based on how that man rode atop it without issue. 
Hoplite had been so distracted with the moving tree that he hadn't noticed that the root wall had begun sucking up the entire palisade with its entangling roots. He almost drew his shotgun to start blasting when one of the roots drooped down a little too close to his helmet before redirecting toward the palisade to assist its ascent. Would there be any more baffling sights today? You better get running Lance, one of the guards said, the Hark will want to hear about this. Fiends in the forest, he shook his head, brushing his hair over one of his pointed ears. Pointed ears. Lance removed her mask then, revealing her face once more and pulling down her hood to reveal a long head of pitch black hair. She quickly tied it back in a tail, and Hoplite could see that she too, bore these ears. These colonists. They were mutants. No, not a full-on mutant, but at least a deviation of the standard genetic template common for humans. Considering that all three of these people had the same kind of mutation, it was safe to assume a majority of the local populace would also possess this minor change in biology. But, perhaps the change was deeper beneath the surface. If Lance truly possessed no bionics, then perhaps her skeletal structure was different from standard humans. Thicker bones perhaps? If so, then wouldn't their limbs be broader than that? Lance and these men didn't seem any wider than a normal person, in fact, they seemed marginally thinner, more lean. This construct here saved my life. Lance explained to the guards, I deem it safe for its entry if it wishes it. The guards looked to one another, sharing a concerned look before turning their attention back to Lance, as the watcher says, their life on the line. One of them said, then they both stepped to the side, holding their spears tall. Lance merely nodded at the words and passed through the open gate wordlessly, with Hoplite following right behind her. The guard's eyes followed him as he walked through the gate behind Lance, and he could see them turning their heads to stare at his back. If they knew he could still see them would they have still done that? Probably. Why would Lance's plus life be on the line? Perhaps it was a sort of warning for these watchers, that if they brought in a malignant stranger they would be punished. Hoplite would keep that in mind moving forward. As they passed into the forest, Hoplite could see the gate relower from his rear camera, aided by the prehensile roots. Did they somehow manage to train this creature to do that? How does one domesticate something like this? Would that really keep out the fiends? If they were determined enough, they could likely scale the wall, aided by the many grooves afforded them by the many roots making up its surface, that is unless this wall was capable of repelling climbers. If the roots could drink up a whole gate, why not suck in invaders attempting to climb it, crushing their bones or whipping them from its surface with its tendrils? The Hark Hall will be at the Ilum tree in the center, we'll get there quicker if we run. Just ignore anyone who stares, we don't get a lot of visitors with a watcher's blessing. Even less so when that visitor is a construct. Lance said, breaking into a run, not that we'll see a lot of folk out tonight, we elves prefer a daytime schedule, though the falling star is sure to have stirred a few. Hoplite followed suit, easily keeping her pace as they moved through the woods. Is that what these colonists called themselves? Elves? That was a fictional species wasn't it? Hoplite distinctly remembered reading a book when he was but a child years before his conscription that had a plethora of fantasy creatures in it, including elves. He hadn't thought about that book in years, he couldn't quite place a name to it anymore, it had to have been over 200 years since he had read it. As he remembered it, Elves had pointed ears and lean frames, much like Lance and those guards had. Perhaps they had access to that novel and decided to name their branch of humanity after the elves. It wasn't the most ridiculous name he'd seen branches come up with. This colony had to have been lost before first contact with the final kind, based on Lance's initial reaction to him talking about them. She had seemed completely ignorant of what the final kind were, perhaps she had misheard him earlier. Have your people made any contact with the final kind yet? Hoplite asked her. I know not what you speak of. She replied. That pretty much confirmed it. There was a chance that just Lance herself was ignorant of their existence, but that was slim. A lost colony from before the first contact era, these people had to have been alone for over 500 years at least. During their entire sprint to reach the Hark Hall, they had passed several dozen moving trees some of which seemed to actually move out of their path as Lance and Hoplite approached. There were some elves that had been awakened by news of this falling star all gawking at him wide-eyed as he followed Lance. They were dressed in fine clothing, looking the furthest thing from destitute but not appearing pompous. 
His earlier hypothesis was confirmed as he saw that all these people bore pointed ears. Unlike Lance, these other elves seemed to have bright blonde hair, so much so they almost seemed to be white. Thankfully none of them tried to stop them as they made way for this Ilum tree. At some point he would need to clarify to Lance that this falling star was nothing more than his escape shuttle. For them to call it such was odd. Why not immediately assume it was a meteorite? It was primitive to think that a star could fall. Perhaps these people had regressed further than he initially thought. Further and further they went, passing the occasional elf or moving tree, the landscape otherwise unchanging save for the thick roots jutting up from the earth. As they drew closer to the Ilum tree, Hoplite noticed these massive roots rising up from the earth in patches, all seemingly leading toward the center. The most notable thing about them being that they bore that very same green glow as the root wall. The moving trees didn't bear this glowing green glow in their roots. Were these glowing roots running all the way back to the root wall? What had Lance called it? The Bastion. They then entered a clearing at long last, bare of any trees but gently writhing with glowing green roots. If these were coming from the center, then that must mean that. The largest tree hoplite had ever seen came into view, easily towering over the highest skyscraper. Had there been any clouds in the sky, he doubted he'd be able to see the huge branches high above, their leaves casting a massive shadow on the tiny forest below. For a moment, he slowed his stride, taking in the immensity of this impossible creature. This tree had to be as large, no, larger than the sparrow. How, how was it even possible that he didn't see this on entry? How didn't he see it from the sparrow itself high in orbit? Perhaps it simply hadn't been quite that large, but still. Impressive isn't it? Lance asked, I'm sure even a construct could appreciate the majesty of the Ilum tree. You said it was a big tree. Hoplite told her, still marveling at the thing. Did I lie? Lance asked, a tinge of sarcasm in her tone. No, Hoplite replied. How did this creature not destroy all other plant life around it? For a creature of such size to exist here, the surrounding wilderness should be a barren wasteland. How nutrient-dense was this soil? Was it an adult version of those moving trees he saw earlier? Were those its young? The questions whirled through his mind uncontrollably, frustrating him until he turned his focus back to the task at hand. How do we reach the Hark Hall? It should have happened already, she said, slowing to a brisk walk, we still haven't been taken. What do you mean Dash? In a single millisecond, and everything around them suddenly vanished. The dark night outside had instantly changed into a large brightly lit circular chamber of gnarled brown wood. Shocked, he immediately raised his shotgun, aiming it at the dozens of elves suddenly surrounding his position above him. They were all seated in benches that had seemingly been grown from the wood beneath their feet, sitting high above Lance and Hoplite. A glowing yellow crystalline structure pulsed above in the center of the ceiling, suspended by glowing green roots that seemed too thin to hold up the tank-sized crystal's weight. It had to be around a hundred feet up there from where Hoplite stood. If it fell then it would crush him and Lance both. It's okay. Lance shouted, trying and failing to push the barrel of his gun downward, we're here. This is the Hark Hall. Hoplite wouldn't remove his finger from the trigger or lower his gun until he was certain that nothing in this chamber was of any immediate danger to him. The ten elves in the high seat seemed to not care about the weapon Hoplite aimed at them. They were as stone-faced as he himself was, though none were able to see it. The golden glow of the crystal illuminated their well-dressed forms, each wearing well-made wool or clinging silks. Hoplite hoped that his shock didn't show through his body language, Certainly he had just been teleported. And teleportation was supposed to be impossible, even for the final kind. What could these people be capable of if they could do something so utterly unfeasible? He would need to confiscate that equipment, whatever it was, as soon as the opportunity presented itself, it could change the tide in the war. A war they had already lost. He internally berated himself for the thought. Hoplite was still alive, and so were the humans that escaped the sparrow. As long as even a few of them remained, the war was still ongoing. He turned his attention from his thoughts to the situation at hand. A circular wall penned Hoplite and Lance below the elves, who continued to stare down at them disapprovingly. There were ten sets of eyes there, all looking expectant. He then noticed that those disapproving glares were directed at Lance, not himself. Lance stared up at him pleadingly, still trying to bring the barrel of the gun down, please. She whispered loudly, hesitantly. He complied, 
remembering the words those gate guards had spoken to her earlier. Hoplite did not lower his guard though, ready to bring up his shotgun to blast the instant something went awry. She nodded thankfully and turned her gaze toward the elves above. I as a watcher of the would have come to deliver important news, she announced loudly. Out with it then Lancelot, a matriarchal elf woman said coldly. Matriarchal, but she bore no wrinkles to show as much. It was those bright green eyes that conveyed the impression, showing wisdom beyond her years. Perhaps elves could live longer than normal humans as in that book he had read as a child. She had horrendously long blonde hair that fell around her seat in waves, spilling over to brush the bare wood beneath her feet. Hoplite couldn't even imagine the hassle of caring for a tenth of that mop, why had this woman grown it out so long? She then looked from Lance to him, her pale green eyes seeming to glow as they took him in from head to foot. She really was a gorgeous woman he supposed. Those thick curves, that perfect symmetrical face, truly the most beautiful woman he had ever. Hoplite felt frozen for a millisecond before he was able to finally tear his eyes away from that bright gaze. What on earth was he thinking of? Where did those thoughts come from? He would need to submit himself for reindoctrination if these base urges returned. The woman seemed taken aback for the briefest of instants before her face resumed that cool stony calm, looking quickly from Hoplite to Lance. None of the others spoke. Fiends have come close to the Bastion Hark Mother. I swear it on my family and honor, they are no more than a few miles from here. Lance told them, her words slicing through the silence like a razor. We must call the tongues for aid, even Akandar if we must. If the fiend wall has fallen, the death spiral will spread. The Hark Hall all looked to each other wide-eyed, some even gasping aloud. Those who gasped suddenly put hands to mouths, looking, embarrassed. For what, Hoplite had no idea, but the Hark Mother spared a quick withering glance to those who had. Also, she said, drawing their attention back to her, this construct saved my life and brought me here to deliver this news, I ask to allow its sanctuary until it is ready to move on. Lance told them, gesturing to Hoplite. He, the Hark Mother said, crossing her arms, I know for a certainty that this construct is a human. She said, staring at him, and a strong-minded one at that. She added thoughtfully, my gaze held him no longer than a hand on a slipfish, but the fact it held him at all reveals his true nature. You've brought a human into the Hark Hall Lancelot, but at no fault of yours. She continued more sympathetically, unfortunately, this means that you must be stripped of rank. We will allow you to stay in the Feywood as you wish, but you will never watch again. Forgive me, I do not wish this upon you, but any mistake made by a watcher must be punished by stripping of rank. Lance went wide-eyed, staring dumbfounded at Hoplite before falling to her knees, that's not fair, W we allow men into the Feywood and even the Bastions sometimes, she said, a stutter to her voice, so why not here, I didn't know he was human I swear it, I do not doubt you Lancelot, it is as foundation commanded millennia ago, the heart call does not question the will of the gods Lancelot, I am sorry, but you are dead to the watchers now. The Hark Mother said with a tinge of sadness to her tone, there are other societies you can join, perhaps the Tree Hunters, she asked, attempting to sound soothing. Lance said nothing, merely sitting there and staring up at the gathered members of the Hark Hall with disbelief. The other members of the Hall averted their gaze from Lance's pleading eyes, shame plain on their faces. Whether it was for Lance's mistake or for themselves Hoplite was not sure. The Hark Mother actually seemed to be genuinely displeased with this outcome, perhaps there could be a way for him to change things. What do you intend to do with me? Hoplite asked in a flat tone. You, well, there isn't a specific law for a situation such as this. No human has ever set foot in the Hark Hall. I'm not human. Hoplite told her, so you must restore Lance's rank. Everyone in the chamber stared at the Hark Mother, even Lance, who wore a confused expression. My eyes make human men unable to resist my allure, it is how I test, uncertain visitors. She told him, I felt your eyes on me as you felt mine on yours. I resisted. He told her, by your laws I believe that you must restore her rank. Silence passed between the members of the Hark Hall, all seeming to stare deeply into one another's eyes. Why weren't they saying anything? Another elf a tall lean fellow with long black hair and smooth features, shot a glance at the Hark Mother. They both stared at one another for a long while before finally she smiled. While a human of pure blood is not allowed by law within this hall, 
I suppose that one such as you would not count as a full-on human. Jerival tells me you are certainly part man, part something else. By technicality, I rule that Lance keeps her rank as watcher. She said, the relief in her voice seeming genuine. This cannot be. Another elf shouted, standing from his bench to glare down at Hoplite. He was another tall elf, though far more lanky than lean, and with a lower brow than the dark-haired fellow and with lighter locks. His angry red eyes stared accusation at Lance. He had never seen that shade of eye color before on a person, yet another minor mutation to constitute this branch of humanity. Even if he possesses the smallest drop of human blood, Foundation has ruled that she must be stripped of rank. You will not bend the rules of our Lord Drowy, he shouted, a vein popping on his forehead from the intensity of his voice. You break even the most basic of rules by simply speaking aloud Turlin, do not preach to me about bending rules when you yourself outright break them. He opened his mouth again, but the rest of the chamber stared daggers at Turlin. Whatever he had been about to say was stuffed back down his throat with a cough. Turlin's jaw clenched tightly, to the point where Hoplite believed that the elf might just crack a tooth. This one had a temper on him. Lance stood quickly, bowing to the Hark Mother and then quickly turning to beam up at him, Thank you Hoplite, I won't forget this, truly, she whispered. He nodded and looked to the elf man who must have been Jerival. How did he and the Hark Mother communicate wordlessly? Did they possess matching communication implants? And more importantly, how was it that Jerival knew about Project Chimera? The Hark's request. Hoplite had been disappointed to discover that the Hark all knew nothing of Turner, but he supposed that was to be expected. He had been far more disappointed to find out that they possessed no radio equipment whatsoever, at least that's what they had claimed. The Hark Mother had asked that Lance recite the Watcher's Silence, an oath to keep all disgust in here a secret. Why they had to bother with such a ritual Hoplite had no idea. Wouldn't it be assumed that the Watcher brought in wouldn't talk about whatever happened inside? He did not bring it up though, for he had other more pressing matters to discuss with these elves. More specifically, the Hark Mother, who spoke for all members of the Hark Hall. Somehow the other elves present, save for Lance, were capable of some kind of mental communication with one another. He had heard that such technology was used by the higher UPS in the Turnan government, but he himself had never seen it used until today. Certainly it had to be some kind of brain implant, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. So what did the Hark Mother say when Hoplite brought it up? It was magic. Hoplite had actually shaken his head in disbelief. Magic, that was preposterous. He had told her that exact thought and she smiled at him as if he were a clueless child. He had felt something very close to indignant at that insufferable smile. Perhaps it was something to do with those strange eyes of hers. Apparently, they were magic, too. Hoplite had argued with them about it for some time before he finally gave up on the subject. If they wanted to call science magic then let them. He had other questions that he needed to ask, all of which the Hark Hall had been happy to answer, all save for Turlin of course who stared daggers at him and Lance with those angry red eyes. Well, just Lance after Hoplite cocked his helmet toward him. Turlin had not wanted to maintain a glare with him after that. Hoplite had dealt with many marine lieutenants that way, something that the soldiers under their command had laughed about after it had been done. Hoplite never understood why they considered it funny. One of the things he asked about was the shape of this planet. Why was it shaped like an eyeball? How did that come about? The answer. The gods made it so. Of course. Gods. What are the fiends? Poor souls possessed by the death spiral curse. First time he'd heard of this death spiral. Must be some kind of nanotech if it can revive corpses. Of course though, when he said the word nanotech, they all stared at him like he was from a different planet. Which, well, he supposed he was at that. Where was the nearest human settlement? The city of Akandar to the east. Hoplite had figured that if these elves had laws against humans coming into the Hark Hall, then there must be an unmutated branch of humanity on the planet. He deeply desired to seek contact with them when he could, even if they were primitive. Do they possess any means of transportation? Yes they have horses despite the fact that he knew the answer. Hoplite asked if this Akandar had radio equipment, to which he was of course told no. How had he been teleported to this place? The Hark Crystal, its magic is powerful enough to do so. That ruined his plans for confiscation for now. Whatever tech was in that crystal, 
It was much too large to move even in his armor, in fact he hadn't even been sure how he would have gotten it out of that chamber. Perhaps the crystal itself wasn't tech, but maybe there was some kind of device that harnessed whatever that glow was. Could the Hark crystal be a new element that made teleportation possible? No, Foundation made it for us to summon those seeking an audience to the Hark Hall. Who was Foundation? The Pillar God Drowie. Of course, he wished that he could have questioned Jerival about his knowledge of Chimera, but Hoplite had been conditioned to not speak of it by name. Hoplite had to word it carefully, phrasing it as, how does he know about my blood? His eyes can see the twisting ladders of the blood. Hoplite's frustration with these backwards bumpkins had grown significantly after hearing that. The twisted ladders of blood surely had to be DNA, but when he said that they again looked confused, Hoplite had merely dropped the subject. Jerival had opened his mouth for a second, looking ready to ask Hoplite a question directly. The elf caught himself however, and his mouth snapped shut. If he didn't know what DNA was, then he couldn't possibly know about Chimera, that and the fact that this was a colony lost long before the first contact. Chimera hadn't even been established until around a hundred years after first contact after all. Hoplite still would question him of course, and if he did know about Chimera, Jerival likely did not. But if he mentioned it by name to these elves, well, then Hoplite wouldn't have any choice for what would come next. He returned his focus to the questioning, pushing Project Chimera and Jerival to the back of his mind. Did they possess any ballistic weaponry? Yes we do have ballistas, as does Akandar. We've heard of thunderstaves such as the one in your possession. That piqued his interest. If they thought of his shotgun as a thunderstaff, then either there were humans with ballistics or these elves had somehow heard of Turnan soldiers. He pressed them on the matter. Yes, the dragon men of the Blastlands have implements almost like yours, though Pago informs me that they do not share these tools with outsiders. He didn't know which elf above was Pago, but Hoplite didn't really care at the moment. Dragon men. Hoplite almost shook his head again, but he supposed that this could simply be another mutated branch. He could almost picture them, humanoids with scales, but purely human features otherwise. So no guns then, at least not around these parts. These blast lands seem to have some kind of ballistics, though what type remained to be seen. Would it be primitive muskets or automatic rifles? Maybe these dragon mutants remembered their turn and heritage. Hoplite didn't know where these blast lands were, but he would be going there if he couldn't find any of his fellow turnans first. That was just to name a few of his own questions, they also had several of their own. Where did Hoplite come from? The answer, from space, next to the green moon. They had all stared at each other in expected silence for a long time before they had asked if he had come from the monster next to the moon. He explained that the monster was a ship piloted by the final kind but they still didn't know what he was talking about. That further solidified the thought that these people had been lost long before the first contact era. Were you the falling star? That was his escape pod, not a falling star. He explained to them exactly what an escape pod was and Hoplite informed them that they were to stay away from its contents as they were turn and property. In truth he really wasn't worried about them pilfering the contents of the pod, those doors were capable of withstanding atmospheric entry, nothing these people had access to should be able to breach the doors, unless there was some other magic they could use for that purpose. What is the final kind? A cosmopolitan alien Imperium dead set on conquering the galaxy by any means necessary. The galaxy. It had taken a frustrating amount of time to explain the concept of a galaxy to these people, but they still didn't quite seem to understand what he meant when he was done explaining it. He had been told by marines that he wasn't exactly the best at explanations. Hoplite wasn't supposed to be, he was a soldier, not a professor. You are a human from the outer planes. He was from Earth, the home planet of the human race. Humans were made from the infinite blood of Zod as were all the races on Akulis. If you are not of the blood of Zod then you are from another realm of existence. Alternate realities weren't real, these people were simply too steeped in their own backward mythology to see it. He didn't argue the point, it didn't seem as if there was any way he could get through to these people. Can you depend on what you know as fact any longer? A small voice in the back of his mind said it could have been that the antimatter bomb did send you to another dash. He shut the voice down. 
They had been about to ask him another question when another watcher, a tall man with bright blonde hair, simply appeared right next to him without warning. There was nothing to warn Hoplite of this elf's arrival, he hadn't shown up on his motion tracker at all. That almost made the hair on his neck stand on end. This crystal could somehow teleport matter based on the intent of the person wanting to be teleported, not the press of a button, not purely based on proximity, but intent. The elf had immediately fallen to his knees before the Hark Hall, sweat beading down his face. His pitch black uniform was the mirror image of Lancers. The fiend wall is fallen, he had shouted in terror, we barely keep them away from the bastion, we must send for aid. Indeed, the whole Hark Hall had fallen silent and Lance had stiffened, going wide-eyed. In very little time, Lance had been given new instructions and Hoplite had been asked to provide aid to the elves to keep the fiends back. Hoplite had agreed with no reluctance, it was his job to protect humanity and he would do so until he died. The Hark Hall indeed seemed surprised by his almost immediate acceptance of their request, looking between one another with their faces unreadable. He didn't quite understand that. Hoplite had just agreed to do what he had done all his life, so why did they look at each other that way? Lancer's instructions were somewhat of a surprise. Watch Hoplite. That was all the Hark Mother said to her and she did not argue the matter. Surely it was so Hoplite could not go around unsupervised, but he didn't argue with this either. If he wanted to go somewhere the Hark Hall didn't want him to go they could not stop him either way. Lance actually seemed eager to go with him, as if she had been told to spend time with a friend rather than keep an eye on an outsider. Likely that was how she felt about it, considering how he had helped her keep her rank as Watcher. That was why he was out in the Feywood now. Three days later, shooting and stabbing shambling fiends of all shapes and sizes alongside Lance wherever he could find them. As soon as this threat was eliminated or at least reduced, Hoplite would return to the Hark Hall to question them further, he was far from done with them. Before they had left they attempted to put him under the command of some watchlord. Hoplite firmly informed them that no such thing were to happen. He would find fiends and eliminate them far more quickly on his own, or at least just with Lance, than if he were to be placed under the command of someone outside Turner's influence that wouldn't understand his capabilities. They had argued briefly about it, but Hoplite dug his heels in. The Hark Mother had then told him that he didn't know his way around the forest, and that he would need someone to guide him through it. He did not argue this, but pointed out that Lance was going to be with him during this skirmish, so he could not get lost. Lance actually seemed embarrassed by him saying that, face going red as she grimaced at the floor. The Hark Mother gave him a wry look but argued no further. Why the look? Had he said something funny? After they conceded to him, he and Lance had been teleported back outside to fight this little campaign. In these three days he and Lance alone had to have killed around 200 of what the Watchers called lesser fiends, they were definitely easy to put down, lesser was right. Those rotting teeth and claws were still deadly enough as he had seen a Watcher pulled down by a trio of rotting hounds. The man had sustained grievous yet treatable injuries after Hoplite had blown them all away with his pistol but the man immediately drew his blade and slit his own throat. Hoplite had been surprised by this, but Lance had merely dragged the corpse to the foot of a nearby tree, leaving it there to be taken back to the roots. Apparently, this death spiral curse could spread through wounds caused by fiends. With lesser fiends, there had to be multiple open wounds to spread the curse, but normal fiends could spread it far easier. These normal fiends were apparently far worse than the lesser fiends they had been facing. Since that man had sustained enough wounds to turn into a normal fiend, he had taken his own life, something that seemingly every watcher had no reluctance in doing, should it come to that. These normal fiends were actually humans that had gotten this disease, but they weren't undead as these lesser fiends supposedly were. Apparently, these fiends retained their sapience and could not die something that Hoplite outright refused to believe. Lance explained that fiends didn't cross the shot between the Feywood and Fiendwood, which was why they only fought lesser fiends now. This shot was in fact one of those massive veins he had seen in orbit when he had mistakenly believed that the planet was an eyeball. There was a shot between each of the continents, each one as wide as a sea and each connecting the ocean surrounding the continents to the swirling ocean in the center of the world. Since this was the case, Hoplite marked these undying fiends up to simple superstition. Lance had confirmed that she had never even seen one before, and that most watchers hadn't either. 
It made sense then, why they thought human fiends were unkillable. It was pure and simple exaggeration. Perhaps they were difficult to kill, but unkillable. Ridiculous. He would prove that to her if ever they found one wandering the Feywood. The sun was just now beginning to set over the Feywood, the dim orange light slipping between the broad leaves overhead. After three days of fighting in this forest, he noticed something. Almost every species of tree he knew about was within these woods. Everything from willows and pines to cherry blossoms and maples. The result was a garish mixture of colors above his head, a sight that wasn't displeasing to him. It was the same with all the other plant life in the wood, radiant with colorful flowers and bursting with full ripe berries. The exposure to all this color was strange to him. Hop light was used to gunmetal gray and the different splashes of blood in war, with some brown wastelands here and there when he was deployed planetside. So, Lance said, following close behind him, can I see what's in the star, the uh, pod next time we go back. He had been making routine stops at the pod to restock on ammunition, keeping Lance and every other curious watcher well away from its contents. No, he replied simply. She grumbled but didn't argue the point. Other watchers hopped around in the trees above them, all wearing a color-blending variant of Lance's garb. There were many of them, most going about the same task, to hunt for intruders and to watch them until they left. Or more likely with the recent development of the fiend walls collapse, hunting for fiends to put them down. Day watchers were given those garments to blend in better with the surrounding forest, while night watchers such as Lance were given light drinking black garb to better blend in with the darkness. He didn't quite understand why they simply didn't give night watchers the same color blending garb as day watchers, but he supposed that the color blending version was a fair bit harder to make than simple pitch black clothing. The explanation for why day watchers clothing could color shift was of course, magic. Hoplite had nearly given up asking why certain things were the way they were on this planet. Three days of constantly being told, magic this or, the gods that, was really beginning to frustrate him. There wasn't a shred of common sense among these elves, that was all there was to it. When do you have to, Lance started, trailing off. When do I what? Hoplite asked, checking his rear cameras to see her expression. She looked somewhat embarrassed. He had no idea why. When do you? I mean to say. When do you, P? She asked, rubbing a hand through her long black hair. I don't have to yet, he replied. It's been three days hoplite. Have you even slept? She asked, bafflement on her face. No, I don't need to yet, he said matter-of-factly. He would like to keep it that way for as long as he could. Thankfully he hadn't eaten or drank anything prior to suiting up. The result however was that he was severely dehydrated and practically starving. If he stopped to remove his helmet to eat and drink however, he would have another problem on his hands later. He could go far longer without food or water than a normal human, but that didn't mean that it was healthy for him to go without it for this long. At this rate he'd be dead within the next few days. Five at most, but he should take care of his needs before that point. He couldn't protect anybody if he was recovering from severe dehydration alongside starvation. Hoplite again was wishing that the phalanx suit had come with a built-in waste disposal, but there was no use in lamenting the fact that it wasn't there. He dreaded it, but it would be time to remove the suit when he returned to the pod this next visit, or at least just the helmet so he could eat and drink. When he inevitably had to take the suit off is what he dreaded, for the process of reattaching the individual pieces of his armor on his own would be hours long, even with the tools he procured from engineering. I haven't seen you sleep Lance, Hoplite told her. He hadn't either, not since they had both set out patrolling through the Feywood. She had to take breaks here and there to eat and drink of course, but she had not slept a wink. Lance didn't even seem the least bit tired. Elves don't sleep nearly as much as you lazy humans do. She said with a small laugh, besides, I got a full two hours of rest before I found you, I'm good for the rest of the week. I don't need that much sleep either. Hoplite said, so don't worry about it. Look, Lance started, fists on hips as she walked, you need to take care of yourself before you fall over dead, simple as that. She sniffed, I can forage up some berries and bag some bunnies for you and it's no bother if you want to drink from my canteen. I can't put the suit back on easily once I take it off. Hoplite said, I want to keep it on as long as I can, it will take hours to put it back together. Well that's just silly. Who makes a suit of armor that hard to put on? 
she said with a shake of her head, honestly seems stupid to me, and I thought simple human plate armor was enough of a bother. Hoplite couldn't exactly say she was wrong, but with how complex the phalanx suit was it was simply impossible to put it back on quickly without an engineer or an assembler. On the flip side though, it was surprisingly easy to take off, all it took was a bump of his chin and several sections of the armor would open. After a few minutes he could be out of the suit in its entirety. The helmet he could take off and put back on, but he'd rather keep wearing it till he was back to the pod. Just let me know when you're ready to come out of that armor, I'll get a meal ready for you. She told him, he didn't say anything. Hoplite then paused, noticing that his shotgun felt, light. It was already time to go back to the pod again to restock. He still had plenty of rounds for his other guns, but he wanted all the shells he could carry. His stomach growled hungrily at him and he did his best to ignore it. He hadn't even eaten before entering Creo. Again he tried to ignore the thought, and failed. It was time to eat and drink. There were canteens and calorie-dense ration bars stored beneath the seats of the pod, as it was for all escape shuttles. His throat felt like burnt paper and his limbs felt leaden. His eyes were growing heavier and heavier by the day. He needed to take care of himself before his body suffered permanent damage. He turned and scooped up Lance without a word. She only gave a small gasp as he sprinted headlong toward the pod. She was well used to this by now, but he saw that the other watchers in the trees overhead flinched at his sudden speed. Their surprise at his speed could only be matched by their terror of his weapons. The other watchers genuinely seemed to be scared witless of them, but Lance had grown used to his thunderstaves by now. It only took an hour to reach the crash site at his top speed, and when he put down Lance he saw that her hair had been blasted back by the wind. He had set her down behind a huge tree next to the site, peeking around the trunk to see if anyone was around his pod. To his surprise, there indeed were people around the shuttle, but they weren't watchers. Five people and some horrific kind of mutant were all staring at his shuttle. The mutant had drawn his attention first due to just how severe the changes were. The top half was a handsome long-haired muscular human, crossing his arms and looking down upon Hoplite's pod with a curious glint in his black eyes. The lower half was a horrific monstrosity, the upper half's body ended halfway down, ending in another, larger body. A massive face with a gaping maw and three tongues sticking out of its mouth made up the center of this second torso, one of the tongues reaching up occasionally to lick one of the creature's two big black eyes. Its bold nose hung slightly over the gaping three-tongued maw, which masticated the back of the lolling tongues. Another set of inhumanly large shoulders stuck out from above this second horrific face, each with a long ape-like arm ending in two broad furled fingers that each ended in a point. The thing held itself aloft with two thick squat legs, using its two lower arms for better balance. Hoplite had never seen such a massive mutation in his life. A tall blonde handsome man stood next to the mutant, seemingly not bothered by the massive open mouth just a few paces away from him. Hoplite could see that this man's ears were round, another human at last, but a local to this planet based on his dress. He wore a blood-red headband on his forehead, the color complementing the black and red scrollwork on his shirt. At least, what Hoplite could see of his shirt beneath a set of gleaming splint mail. His trousers were of a pure white with more intricate scrollwork, with the rest of it stuffed inside a pair of well-made leather boots. Broad-shouldered and holding his back straight enough to impress any officer, he gave off an air of sure confidence in himself. The second man, another mutant, stood close to the pod, inspecting the door. Compared with the first, this mutant's change was a small thing. He possessed bright red skin and white hair behind a pair of curving black horns, like that of a goat. He too was handsome of face, and there was a mischievous glint in his fiery eyes. He wore no shirt but a pair of huge baggy white trousers ending in slippered feet. His right hand and forearm were marred by some kind of scar or birthmark. It was a grey patch of skin, spread out like a bulging vein from the tips of his otherwise red fingers to his elbow. He was of a slight build, showing off all the lean muscle that Hoplite knew female marines would love, based on those strange magazines he'd seen them reading. The third, a woman this time, stood a bit further behind the rest of the group. Her face was eerily symmetrical, so perfect that she seemed almost uncanny. Another kind of minor mutation perhaps, but she looked like a human. Long brown hair was held back in a loose ponytail, and with his enhanced vision he could see even from here that she had heterochromia, 
one eye blue, and one eye brown. Her clothes were simple compared to the others, with a simple brown woolen shirt and cotton pants of the same shade. A very short and slight woman, she wouldn't even come up to Lance's shoulders if they were placed side to side. The fourth was a man of average height and looks, but held himself like a compressed spring, seemingly ready to leap in any direction with the long sword at his belt. Another human, but his skin was of an extremely pale complexion, like he hadn't seen the sun in years. A lot like Hoplite's own skin really. His long black hair was swept back from his hard square face, revealing a pair of normal brown eyes. He wore a simple shirt and trousers with two pairs of belts hung loosely around his waist with a distinctly bright red sash worn across his middle. A long dark green cape hung around his shoulders, falling over a large backpack that just barely touched the forest floor. The fifth and final person was another elf-like Lance, or perhaps a human. Those ears certainly looked like they may have a point from here, but it was far less prominent when compared to the other elf ears he had seen. She was well muscled but held herself slightly hunched, looking mostly at the ground beneath her feet. The most heavily armored of this group, she wore primitive, to his standards, shining plate armor. Curly blonde hair was held back from her face in a tight ponytail, revealing a pretty face marred by a small scar at her lip. He could see only now that a sixth humanoid shape was making way toward the group out of the forest, but he ducked his head back before he could discern any details. The square-faced man had turned toward Hoplite's position. He could have just been discovered. Stay here, Hoplite told Lance as he clipped his shotgun to his back. Lance seemed confused before she heard the drifting conversation between the strangers, and she drew her dagger. Hoplite then dug his fingers into the bark of the tree, and began climbing straight up the trunk, the bark crunching lightly beneath his fingers. It wasn't likely that any of the strangers heard it, but it was still too loud for his liking. He pulled himself up on top of a high branch looking down to see the strangers all looking up at him wide-eyed. Time to see if these locals were the aggressive type. Mutated Misfits Hoplite stared down at the strangers, his shotgun not yet aimed but ready to be if the need arose. Suddenly, the square-faced man walked forward to the base of Hoplite's tree and moved to begin climbing up it. Hoplite aimed his shotgun down at the pale man and he froze. Even if he didn't understand what a gun was, he clearly understood that whatever Hoplite was holding was a weapon. Identify. Hoplite ordered. The strangers all looked at each other, the two-faced mutant staring up at him with those black eyes. That one he could put down with a blast of his shotgun, but Hoplite supposed the same could be said of all of these people. None of them wore armor that could stop these shells. The elf woman in full plate stepped forward, placing a hand to her chest as the pale man stepped away from the tree. I am Twindil, a paladin of Athena, the pillar god of tranquility. He searched those green eyes of hers, but there wasn't anything but confidence in those eyes. A paladin. She certainly didn't look like one. The generation of super soldiers before Hoplite had been called paladins, but they weren't all that common nowadays. Hoplite had met and even fought side by side with a few, and they shared a Hoplite's disposition. After all, they went through the same training as Hoplite's, just without the mutations that accompanied Project Chimera. This woman did not have those same cold empty eyes, indeed they seemed brimming with life. She actually smiled at him when she saw his head cock toward her, the small scar on her lip only pulling it down slightly. No, this girl was not turn and personnel, not with those ears and that gear. The pale man then coughed and rubbed the back of his head, not glancing up at Hoplite as he spoke. I'm Kid K.A. I are, am a tongue of Zod. He said, seemingly straining to speak the words. Whoever this man was, Hoplite could tell that he didn't speak very often based on the croak in his voice, either that or he smoked an unhealthy amount of tobacco like the sergeants on board the Sparrow. Kid K.A. then lifted up the back of his hand, displaying it to show that it had been branded with the image of a tongue. He had heard mention of tongues of sort before in the Hark Hall. Were these all tongues? Likely not, Twindil likely would have introduced herself as such if that was so. The red-skinned mutant then began pushing the buttons on the keypad to Hoplite's pod, and Hoplite leapt from his branch. He collided with the ground with a resounding crash, landing next to Kid K.A. and kicking up dirt and grass all over his clothing. Kid K.A. grimaced and wiped away the grass and dirt mumbling under his breath in a dissatisfied tone. Hoplite raised his shotgun and aimed it at the red mutant, step away from the pod now. 
he ordered, approaching while keeping an eye on everyone surrounding him. Whoa, okay okay, was just curious was all, the mutant said. His voice was light with a tone of mischievousness to it, like those privates aboard the Sparrow that preferred to goof off rather than be productive. Name's Elam, and anyway it's not like it's yours, we were here first, so I call dibs. He scratched at one of his black horns as he backed away from the pod, compressing his lips to a fine line while somehow also managing to stare longingly at the crashed shuttle. That is turn and property, Hoplite said, seeing Lance emerge from behind her tree, there are no dibs. Dot. He had heard that term before between a couple exotroops concerning a cup of ice cream once. The two had almost come to blows. Indeed Elam looked irritated that he could not claim Hoplite's pod for himself. It was then that Hoplite noticed the other watchers in the trees above them, it seemed as if around thirty were there, all staring silently at him and the strangers. Were they here before or had they followed these people? Lance had told him that one of the many watchers' duties was to observe trespassers until they left the forest, and that meant following them until they were gone. Or had they been scheming a way to break into his shuttle? He turned his attention back to Elam, who stared back seemingly unconcerned. He crossed his arms and huffed, turning away from Hoplite, seemingly irritated. Never heard of Turbot or whatever the hells you called it. Keep it then. Fine. Elam said, as if it were his to give away in the first place. Hoplite looked to the blonde man wearing the red headband then, who stood next to the two-faced mutant with a hand on a sword at his belt. I'm Alistair. The blonde man said, this here is the angel and my idolum Baomiel. He finished, gesturing with a nod to the two-faced mutant. Hoplite was of a height with the creature that Alistair had named, Angel. It glared at him, those arms crossed over its broad chest. That, Hoplite started in a deadpan, is a mutant. Alistair stared confusion at Hoplite, and Baomiel's upper half frowned at Hoplite as the lower half continued to lick its own eyeballs. No, Alistair said with a shake of his head, see, he is a summoned angel from the astral plane. I can summon him and dismiss him at will. I am Athia Golem. He said as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Hoplite did not argue the point, nor did he explain that he was really a human, not a golem. He instead turned his attention to the woman with the eerily symmetrical face. Her blue and green eyes found him, seeming to try and bore into his very soul. Uncanny indeed, there was some kind of mutation besides the heterochromia there though he could not place it purely based on her appearance. Oh, she said, as if she only just now noticed him, I'm Nolvi. I can stare pretty all right I guess. With that, Nolvi began staring at the forest floor, seemingly zoning off the very instant those eyes found the ground. Alistair shook his head and removed his hand from the sword hilt. She is, uh, a bit, vacuous, do not mind her. Lance was speaking to Kid K.A. now, who was looking more drained talking to her than he had speaking to Hoplite. These people did not seem hostile, but that didn't mean that she should have broken her orders to leave cover. After all the situation was still unresolved, he needed to question everyone and then clear these people out of here. At least from his shuttle, if his hunch was correct, then they would be heading for the fiend wall that had collapsed. A thought then occurred to him, but he would act on that after this was all said and done. The sixth man, an old-looking elf wearing a black watcher's outfit approached, big dark bags under aged wise green eyes. Furrows carved their ways through his skin and he held himself in a slight hunch, bushy dark eyebrows drooping down. His long dark hair was held back in a single ponytail, not a single grey among that head of black despite the wrinkles on his face. An old elf, seemed these had a lifespan after all. Instead of saying anything, the old elf simply sat on the ground staring uncaringly at Hoplite for a moment before looking to Alistair. Got any food? Alistair then compressed his lips in a tight line, No. You eat enough already Theopolu. We do not have enough rations to make this trip if you keep eating the way you have been dash. Yeah I got some. Kid K.A. said, leaving Lance's company and lightly jogging over to where the old elf sat today. Hoplite stared as he pulled out a large piece of hardtack, handing it to the old elf while Alistair glared daggers at Kid K.A. The old elf, Theopolu, wasted no time in consuming the fist-sized morsel. Hoplite stared in near bafflement as he saw the elf swallow the hardtack without chewing it. It was as if Theopolu's throat had expanded to allow it to fall straight into his stomach. 
Perhaps elves were more mutated than he thought. But then why was Lance staring in horror at the Opalu? If all elves could eat like that then she would not be staring wide-eyed like that. The blonde elf girl, Twindil, then gently grabbed her by the arm, giving a small smile. He just does that. I've never really had a chance to, uh, talk to one of you before. Twindil said with brief hesitation, well, besides the Opalu anyway, she said quickly, but he doesn't like to talk. See, I'm actually half-elf and I was wanting to ask if Dash. That's enough. Hoplite cut in, what are you all doing here? He noticed that around 20 of the Watchers had left the trees above. Why would they do that? The threat wasn't gone yet. Twindil actually jumped, her plate armor clinking together as she stared at him with surprise, we heard that the fiend wall fell. We hired Theopoli to guide us through the Feywood to reach it. She smiled again, after all, Athena wouldn't approve of such chaos spreading through the land, I will purge it. Kid Ka nodded in agreement, but didn't say anything more. We came upon this, did you call it a pod? Alistair asked before continuing, on the way there. And, I'm going to be completely honest with you here, we were going to loot it. Alistair said with a shrug, we didn't know it was yours okay. No harm, no foul. Gotta ask though, he said, lifting an eyebrow at Hoplite, is this one of the falling stars? Pretty much everyone saw at least a few of them. Can't help but notice that this place looks like it got split down the middle, like it crashed here. They weren't stars, they were escape pods. Hoplite told him, have you found any others? Were there humans in them? The party then all stared at one another before turning back to Hoplite. Kid Ka cleared his throat. Not humans exactly, he said, pulling something out from beneath his cape, it was these four armed monkey things. Sitting there. Attached to Kid Ka's hip was a completely cleaned Yugoro skull, the ape-like alien in forces of the final kind. Hoplite stared in bafflement at the thing. That was definitely a Yugoro, but how had these people managed to kill one of them with such primitive technology? He could not believe that they had tried to fight it with swords and such, perhaps the angel, Baomiel could, but even then that seemed unlikely. There were two of them. I only wanted one skull though. Kid Ka said, we killed them and took their stuff. Two of them. If there wasn't proof of at least one before his very eyes Hoplite would have dismissed the idea entirely. They must have been severely wounded when these locals had found them, otherwise they would have. They were tough too, Twindle said, pulling out a massive sword sheathed at her back, could barely cut into them with this thing after they left that, pod of theirs. Hoplite stared at the dainty, compared to him anyway woman. This had to be some kind of mistake, one Yugoro should have been more than a match for this entire group of mutated misfits. But perhaps that was it. They had to be much more powerful than a normal person to be able to kill two Yugoros with just swords and bows. If they took all of their gear as well after killing them, then that meant they had taken their plasma guns as well. Hoplite considered confiscating them, but held off. If these people weren't hostile and were killing final kind, then perhaps they should be allowed to hold on to them in case they ran into any more. Anything and everything should be used by humanity to defend themselves from final kind invaders. Based on their earlier reaction, Hoplite also guessed they had no idea what Turner was either. Well I helped. Alistair said, I made you bigger than they were and I sucked away their essence with this. Hoplite then saw as Alistair seemingly summoned golden flame from the palm of his hand. Civilian bionic in his hand that produces colored flame surely. A strange bionic to have but civilians were prone to installing useless ones. Strange that it didn't burn his hand, even more strange that there was nowhere the flame was emitting from on his palm. It simply was. Just a strange trick. Maybe some advanced holographs. Yes, that had to be it. Elam sniffed then, yeah. What about me? I sprayed them with acid. In the face. Like this. He said, aiming a single red finger at the ground in front of him. A stream of green bubbling fluid emerged an inch from his finger, pooling onto a tree branch and eating away the bark rapidly. Hoplite resisted the urge to raise his shotgun. It was just some kind of strange bionic he hadn't heard of. Why he could see no tube emerging from his finger didn't change that, perhaps it was, cloaked. There really was no other explanation. Ow! Kid Ka suddenly shouted, sticking a suddenly bleeding finger into his mouth. 
It seemed as if he were trying to pluck a bright red rose from a tangle of plants nearby and gouged it on a thorn by accident. Twindle then sighed, walking away from Lance, who stared in open amazement at Alistair and Elam as well. Whatever it was they were doing to produce those tricks, it must not have been a common sight for her. Twindle reached Kid K.A. then, pulling the finger from his mouth and giving a small sigh as she put a hand to a golden chain around her neck. It looked as if she were clutching something, and she shut her eyes and uttered something he couldn't understand. Akali Umo Afina Lakrush. A golden glow emerged from the small injury, the wound sealing instantly when the glow dispersed. Kid K.A. took his hand back and smiled, flashing her a thumbs up. You have to be more careful, she told him seriously. He sighed then, I know, but I wanted it. Hoplite couldn't believe it, but he thought his jaw might be agape. Surely that had to be, it must have been a, certainly it was. Ah, that was it, it was nanomachines. True, nanomachines did not glow, or were even visible in any way, but there was no other explanation for how that wound had closed so quickly, without even, a small scar. Not to mention that nanomachines could not transfer from person to person, so it had to be something else. But that begged the question, what? Lance cleared her throat nervously, so, some of you can do magic, she said, clearly uncomfortable, I assume that, well you have to be sanctioned yes. You are not, Pillarborn, she asked, suddenly serious. Glances passed between the group save Theopolu, who stared at a beetle crawling on a stump before grabbing it up and promptly eating it whole. It was a stag beetle. Yes, Twindle said after a moment's hesitation, I have my papers on me now if you must look over them. Lance gave a deep sigh of relief once she read over these sanctioning papers. Hoplite himself saw the words, by the head of the Cathedral of Tranquil Athena, Twindle Mermu is sanctioned as a mortal. What did all of that mean? His eyes felt heavier than ever now as he gazed longingly at the pod. All he had to do was step inside and seal it shut then he could take care of himself and be done with all this nonsense. Give them directions. Hoplite ordered Lance. She glared daggers at him then, though for what Hoplite didn't understand. We do want to get to the fiend wall Miss Lance. Twindle said with another small smile, please we can help push back the fiends when we get there, we don't mean any harm to the wood truly. Athena's word on it. Lance turned from Hoplite and smiled back at Twindle. You are three days south. But old Theopoli there knows the way well enough. He used to be a watcher after all. Lance, do you have control of this situation? Hoplite asked as he approached the pod. Ah, uh, yes, she told him with an eyebrow cocked. Call out if they turn hostile. I'll be in the pod. Hoplite told her, do not attempt to follow me in. I will open fire. He warned the group. Strangely, Elam smiled, your magic too. You sanctioned, I can open fire too dash. Hoplite aimed his shotgun as the horned mutant approached Hoplite. Back, he ordered. Elam shook his head, sighing as he looked to Alistair with a pouting lip. I was just curious. Their words became muffled as he sealed the pod doors behind him. They continued speaking for a long while, Hoplite clutching his shotgun and straining his bionic ears to their limit to pick up on any hostile tones. When the voices finally faded away without the sounds of conflict, Hoplite set about removing his armor, trying not to think about the things he had seen the strangers do. He may as well take care of every need, he would eat, drink, and sleep. For hours should be enough assuming that nothing attacked the pod or lance. If there was a body of water nearby, he may take the time to wash as well. That would mean potential exposure to toxins in the environment or an attack from hostiles, but he was fairly confident that he could rinse and be back to the pod before any kind of incident and if other, normal humans could survive exposed on this planet, then surely he could as well. When he was free of his armor, he tore into the rations and full canteens of water, guzzling them down as if he were drowning before slumping over on a row of the seats, sleep ready to claim him. As his eyes finally shut, his thoughts drifted back to just what he had seen today. His dreams were of magic, monsters, and elves, like the book he read as a child over two centuries ago. Out of the Shell Lance put her chin in her palm, her legs dangling over the high branch she sat upon as she stared down at the entrance of the star, a uh, pod that Hoplite secluded himself within. It had been nearly five hours since he sealed the doors shut behind him. 
It was by far the longest amount of time he had taken to restock on his, ammo was what he usually called it for those thunderstaves. She shook her head lightly, her long dark hair shifting with the motion and reflecting the green moonlight overhead. He must have fallen asleep, Lance hadn't known him long, but Hoplite wouldn't take this long to simply restock. Perhaps he had simply succumbed to slumber while he did, whatever else it was he did in there. Should she be concerned? Should she knock? She pondered this for a full minute before she gave a small frown. Nah. He'd come out when he was well and ready, and all the better if he was getting a nap in. Maybe she could bully him into eating and drinking finally. Or maybe he already did that in the pod before sleeping. Lance wished that she could actually see what was in there. There was a window to the interior at the front of the pod, but she could only see her own reflection staring back at her when she attempted to see into the strange metal ovoid from that window. She had studied the pod quite a few times during the routine stops Hoplite had made. At first glance it seemed a solid hunk of metal save for the window and sliding door. But upon closer inspection she could see ultra-thin seams in the construction. Tight rivets kept the whole construct together, and the metal must have been akin to dwarf wrought steel to withstand falling out of the damn sky. There was a matching symbol on the broad sides of it as well, the red paint somewhat marred by the fall. It was an unsettling image of an octopus, the tendrils each ending in a broad human hand, each gripping some kind of sphere. A single massive eye dominated the head of the creature, the pupil unlike any she had seen before on any creature. Was that pupil supposed to be a representation of Hoplite's world? Was this octopus the symbol of this, Turner, he kept blathering on about? Yeah probably. Nodding sagely to herself, her thoughts turned back to Hoplite himself. An honest to drowy outwelder in the flesh, there hadn't been one of those on Akulis for a long time, if myth were to be believed. Outwelders were usually arbiters of change in those old tales that survived the godling wars. They brought almost as much change to the world as those very godling wars, though with less, pain and loss of knowledge. Indeed, outwelders were generally seen in a more positive light than the Pillarborn. They brought new innovations and ideas to Akulis, whilst Pillarborn destroyed nearly everything in their quests to ascend. Oddly, outwelder ideas had a habit of surviving such turbulent times. She supposed that the Harkul would question him more on the subject once they returned to them and her watch was lifted. Lance was not looking forward to another meeting between Hoplite and the Hark Hall however. By the pillars that had to be the most awkward situation she had been in, no one spoke to the Hark Mother how Hoplite had, not ever. It simply wasn't done. But maybe the Hark Mother's curiosity about Outwelder behavior had held her tongue back from lashing. She had always been a curious woman before her rise to motherhood. Surely she must know about Outwelder tales better than Lance herself did. Lance thought about those old stories a moment. What kind of changes had those outwelders wrought? Lance didn't usually pay attention to the old stories, and she seldom remembered them well. As she recalled it, all outwelders were from the same plane and were all humans, though not wrought by the blood of Zod as all races were on Akulis. Her frown deepened. If that were the case, then were they truly human or did they just happen to be creatures that looked exactly like them? Outwelders weren't made of Zod's blood after all. Lance then decided that Outwelders were indeed not technically human, at least not in the way that she knew them as. After all, Jerival had confirmed it by viewing Hoplite's blood, and he apparently wasn't pure human. Maybe he was a half-orc, that would explain his ridiculous size after all. She was actually quite tall for an elf, able to look most human men in the eyes, but Hoplite had been one of a few people to actually make her feel short. It was an infuriating feeling, the world simply felt right when she had to look down at someone to make eye contact. She frowned again and T escaped to herself. Hoplite couldn't be half-orc, there weren't any orcs on, what was the outwelder plane called? A. She couldn't remember. Anyway, there weren't orcs there, so it was just a simple fact that Hoplite was huge. Her eyes narrowed at the sliding door of his pod. Maybe all outwelders were that big. A terrifying thought. Maybe they really were more like orcs than she thought. She rubbed at the point of one of her ears as she considered. Yes, that had to be it, Outwelders were actually orcs that looked like humans. And were smarter. More in control of their tempers. Anne. She pursed her lips before dismissing that train of thought. No matter what she thought, she simply could not bring herself to consider Hoplite as an orc. She'd have to see his face for any sort of confirmation. Suddenly, 
The door to the pod slid open and her eyes widened in surprise as she saw a mass of pale flesh, muscle, and scar tissue emerge from the pod. She stood on her branch, staring down at, well, that had to be hoplite out of his armor, wait, by the pillars why was he naked? A pair of golden eyes found hers and they locked. His face was square and made up of seemingly nothing but hard planes and sharp angles. His round golden eyes were housed beneath a low brow that was as bald as his head. Indeed there seemed to not be a single lick of hair anywhere on him and the sheer amount of scars he possessed didn't help matters. They were mostly burns, all the way from his collarbone to his knees, looking almost like patches of ingrown scales at first glance. There were other scars too, such as the numerous slashes across his face and body going in every direction. Those ones looked as if he had received them in battle, but there were other longer gouges that looked, too precise, as if a surgeon had sought to make a grid out of Hoplite's body. She could not believe that Hoplite would allow such scarring of his body unless it was for a good reason, or if he was restrained. She shuddered at the thought of whatever could possibly restrain this beast. He made many orcs she had seen look scrawny by comparison. Lance felt a tinge of sadness as she looked into those eyes. Elves could all somewhat peer behind the veil of the eyes to glance at the soul within a person. The members of the Hark Hall took their abilities further than that of course, but normal elves could all get a read on a person through eye contact like this. Hoplite's eyes bore almost nothing, as if he barely had a soul to begin with, and what she did see made her visibly shake. This was a man of swirling hatred, anger and, strangely enough, fear. Fear of what though, she could not say, and it was all bottled up in a sturdy container of discipline. A more talented Aesir could probably discern much more than that, but still she wasn't the worst at it. What could a man possibly go through in order to become like this? That hard face bore no laugh lines, as if Hoplite rarely, if ever, smiled. She sniffed and felt her eyes begin to moisten. What a poor man. I need to clean myself, Hoplite said suddenly, causing her to jump and nearly lose her balance on the high branch, guide me to the nearest body of water and when I'm finished I will suit back up and continue our objective. His voice reminded her of a bucket of rocks being poured onto another, bigger rock. He had sounded a bit different in that suit of his but not by much. Hearing it in the roar like this though was quite the experience. She wiped her eyes and leapt from the branch, landing before him and being forced to again crane her neck back to look him in the eyes. Even out of armor Hoplite was head and shoulders taller than her. She had almost forgotten while looking down at him from atop the tree branch that she would need to look up at him once she was ground level again. Her face felt hot with embarrassment, how dare he just come out in his birthday suit like this. It was very improper. Keeping her eyes well above his nudity she said, there is a river a mile to the south, do you, do you not have normal clothes you can wear? No, he replied simply, moving straight past her. It was then that she noticed that he had one of those smaller guns clutched in his right hand, along with another patchwork of scars on his back. And there were, metal circles, grafted to his spinal column that ran all the way up from his tailbone to the base of his neck. What was the purpose of that? Maybe they were magic in some way. Dwarfs could meld with metal in a similar manner, maybe outwelders could too. She quickly pulled up next to him, not wanting to be staring at his rear end for this small trip. His head scanned the forest ahead and he constantly looked above and behind him as they walked. Strange, he never did that while in his armor. Perhaps he was just overly confident when within his plate. What was the objective of those strangers? He asked in a flat tone. Oh yeah. Lance said, well like they said, they're going to the fiend wall to help plug it up. She explained, what we've been fighting is the stragglers that got through the hole before the defenders could block it up. A lot of tongues of Zod have been passing through the Feywood to get to the wall and killing any fiends they find along the way. She continued, pausing for breath, I think that we should go there too. We haven't been running into nearly as many, and I haven't seen even one while you were in your pod. Hoplite nodded, we'll go there after I get suited back up. We'll go there after you eat a proper meal and drink some water, that is what we'll do. She said sternly, placing her fists on her hips. It looked odd while walking but hopefully that would have the added effect she'd need. Lance had seen her mother do that to her father and brothers when they needed to see sense. He did not jerk his head quickly to stare at her, but that slow head turn was unnerving. He stared at her flatly, irritation rising behind those eyes. 
a human likely wouldn't be able to see any difference in Hoplite's eyes, a thought that unsettled her. His face didn't change whatsoever, his brow still glaring and mouth still turned down in a frown. I've already taken care of that, he said, turning that golden gaze away from her, and you do not give orders to me. He finished, his tone hadn't changed but the words still sent a shiver down her spine. Lance gulped and hoped that he didn't hear it. Fists on hips definitely wouldn't work on him, maybe that had been foolish to attempt. Bullying wouldn't work on him and she did not want to be under that golden glare again anytime soon. She blinked. Humans didn't have golden eyes, she was at least 60% sure of that. Maybe the outworld of variety did. Well, it looked pretty neat in any case, if only those eyes weren't windows to such negative emotions. They continued on in silence until they reached the river, and she stared as Hoplite's index finger split open at the tip. And small steel needle stuck out from the hole, and he bent over to stick it into the river. After a moment, Hoplite simply nodded to himself, put his gun on the bank, and promptly face-planted into the water. He swiftly broke the surface like a slipfish, splashing water across her clothes. Lance supposed that was her own fault for standing so close to the bank. As Hoplite scrubbed hands across his scarred frame, Lance asked him what it was that he had just done, to which he replied, testing the pH levels of the water along with detecting potential toxins. Lance had simply stared. At least she had for a second before she realized she was staring at a naked bathing man. Face growing hot again, she quickly turned from him to observe the surrounding forest. The green moon wasn't full tonight, yet the brightness was still such that she could see fairly well in the darkness between the trees. She noticed the occasional forest critter and night watcher going about their business, but she also noticed the watchers in the branches above the river. Not many of them, but they were staring at Hoplite. Certainly it wasn't appropriate, but a watcher's duty was to, well, watch. They hadn't been following her and Hoplite that closely the last couple days but they knew Hoplite only in his armor. These watchers, if they haven't figured out that it was Hoplite yet, would just see a big scary brute bathing in the river. She frowned up at them in thought. They would surely know it was Hoplite, after all, Lance was standing here right beside him, close enough anyway, and they knew that Lance had been assigned to watch him. They would put two and two together surely. An arrow whizzed past her ear and she heard it thud into something behind her. She gasped and turned to see Hoplite gripping the shaft of the arrow in one of his massive fists, snapping it in his tight grip as he glared at its origin. She followed his gaze, seeing an elf scrambling through the moonlit branches above. That elf wasn't a watcher, not a night watcher anyway, the colors shifted beneath the green moonlight to mask his surroundings. Lance might not have seen him if he had held still, but now that he was moving it was as if the air where he was blurred. Night watchers pursued him, clambering over branches after him and shouting orders to stop. Lance turned to explain that it wasn't a night watcher, but he was already up and out of the river, gun clutched in his hand and his wide eyes conveying determination, discipline, and wrath. He sped past her without a word, quickly scaling the closest tree and giving pursuit to the quickly vanishing blur of motion, face unchanging. She quickly ran after him, screaming, alive, we'll need him alive. 